You're joining uh, Teddy Hart, past president and future professional wrestling. And we're doing a shoot interview for Hannibal TV. Proud to be back here with my good friend and uh, showing my house off uh, a little bit of the crib style. And then uh, a nice shoot interview downstairs with the most honest guy in wrestling. I'm with the eldest Hart grandchild, Ted Hart. Do uh, you want to start by telling us what it's like growing up as a Hart grandchild? Um, being the oldest was uh, was an experience. I think I got to spend the most time with uh, the Davy Boy and uh, Dynamite and anyone. I mean, most of the guys never really saw Benoit too much or uh, Brian Pillman too much because they were too young. So I did, I did get to spend some time with both those guys and watching Stampede Wrestling sort of at the tail end of uh, 50 years of running a great promotion and uh, watching Vince come in and take it over and then watching those guys go from uh, wrestling in front of a thousand people at the Stampede Pavilion to all of a sudden being on TV in front of uh, millions of people and getting their own dolls made and uh, watching them get all that money. They were they were all pretty mostly tight for cash for all those years uh, wrestling for Stampede and doing Japan. I think Japan they made good money but it's still I think it was it was sporadic because it was tours compared to where Vince came in with those big contracts. Um, it was neat to see at that time the family was pretty close knit. Brett was very close to Davy Boy and uh, Dynamite. They were all best friends at that time, and uh, different guys back then. Even like Bad News Allen was uh, or Bad News Brown uh, was was in there too. And there's a couple other Mike Mike Straw or Bastion Booger was there. You see like a bunch of guys. A Cuban Assassin I think was supposed to be in WWE, uh, but there was a problem with him and uh, Bad News before. So yeah, like, what happened with that? There was like some knife incident. A knife and. Uh, I forget what bad news had. They each had a weapon or something like that, and they they were um, mad. I guess their wives had got into a fight or something, and they were best friends, but their wives got into some kind of fight, so that uh, caused them to become enemies, and which was which was not good. So um, just getting a text from Jack Evans here, so I'm happy to know Jack's coming back up to do some stuff with me. Um, I don't know. It was my family was uh, it was. It was pretty cool. The Sunday dinners were awesome. Everybody got together every Sunday and ate together. And uh, there was a lot of, a lot of young kids running around the house, all just kind of doing whatever they wanted to. Lots of cats. I remember the memories of a lot of cats. Like my grandfather had like about 14 cats and about five dogs up there. So that gave me the, uh, the idea of having. Uh, cats and dogs getting along in a house and the chaos of all those animals pissing and shitting everywhere and there's always stories of my grandfather uh, with like a spatula and some dog shit which is complete bullshit that's my grandfather was very clean and uh, he never I've never in his life I saw him do anything like with scoop shit and then scoop people's food or something that was like stuff like that I always heard that story from dynamite or something like that I thought it was ridiculous and uh, not valid like part with Teddy Hart is I try to be concise uh, for a guy that smoked pot for years and I'm sure I've had a few concussions uh, my memory is pretty sharp and the truth is the truth and um, sometimes people think I've said too much or I got myself blackballed for telling the truth or uh, they don't believe my story which is even worse because then half the shit I said why would I say it it's buried me more than anything but it was factual so at the end of the day you have to ask yourself this question about me would would you want a guy to come in here and cut an interview because he's trying to get a job in WWE in the future and because he's the truth and he uh, I'm a real motherfucker it's my job to make sure fans that spend their time and money on wrestling they want to know what happened and it's like watching a movie and it's supposed to be based on a real life story and they change half the shit to make it for Hollywood I don't want to be a guy that's cutting a Hollywood promo and if it happened and it's real and we ended up with uh, three hookers and fucking that's what we did then that's what we did or if we ended up smoking pot or getting drunk or uh, something happened in the back this is the way it actually happened and uh, if I got to give a guy shit for something I uh, try to point out the positives that he did first and if it's uh, as if like for like the CM Punk, I've, I've had lots of stuff to say about him in a negative capacity, but at the same time, if you look at my videos over the years, I'm the first guy to give him credit for the progression of what he's done and how hard he's worked and how how great of an opportunist he is. He's taken his opportunities and hit home runs with them, and you can't talk shit about guys like that. Same with Samoa Joe, I had a problem with Samoa Joe for some stuff, but to catch a WWE break at his age and uh, to go in there and deliver good matches and have a reputation of uh, being a tough guy, because the fans believe he is, for 
whatever reasons that's the fans and they, if they believe it then that's true and you made a lot of money in the last couple of years being on TV and uh, congratulations to you guys same with AJ Styles I thought AJ Styles was always top three to five wrestlers in the history of the world best guys ever and uh, worked so long and so hard and consistently in TNA and then went to Japan and hit a home run there and then went to WWE and uh, became a big star there and a world champion which is very hard to do so my hat's off to half these guys if I've ever heard anything bad I've had to say I usually try to come back with something that's good because there's got to be good and bad it's all about the it's all about the balance in wrestling if you're a complete piece of shit I'd probably rather you not even talk about you so but the question about my family uh it was, it was sad too because if you got to see what I got to see, you got to see the family as a whole and over the years the family was destroyed through uh, Owen's death and through, uh, we'll say, a little infighting with Diana and Brett over what happened with Davy Boy and Wembley Stadium kind of stuff where there was just more of like uh, Brett thought he did Davy a favor there and um, seemed to be pretty hard on him after in his book years later about Davy having Davey certain, too. yeah, and certain kind of like drug issues and things that I thought maybe didn't even need to be mentioned so much or were not really true and made it hard for Harry to have to go in and deal with certain things that were put on him by Brett saying stuff about a guy that wasn't alive anymore. It's one thing if the guy can defend himself. I don't remember hearing Davey ever saying anything bad about Brett and I've heard Brett say a lot of bad things about a lot of people and uh, including me and I've had some stuff to say about Brett on the on the other hand who were saying just I wish he would have been smarter and Jim Cornette uh, if you're going to do these shoot interviews and you're going to be such a you know figure in wrestling that's supposed to be so smart and uh, correct with dates and shit go back and actually watch what happened in the scramble cage because you obviously got kind of senile over the years which is understandable being that old and uh, maybe Wendy's all the times you ate Wendy's or something like that fucked your brain up too much grease but uh, the question was too with Brett and Sean obviously I think Brett and Sean would have wanted to be involved in WWE instead of sitting home and retired with all that money that's what you said they both made a lot of money and they don't want it why would they want to be part of wrestling anymore they're retired at home and uh, I'm telling you you missed the boat or something on that I was like no I think if Triple H is still involved in wrestling and Dean Malenko is involved in wrestling and Fit Finley was and Arn Anderson was and Tyson Kidd's an agent now and if Brett was smart in my mind he loved wrestling so much and he was bitching so bad about wrestling and the way it was going then why not be one of the guys that steers the ship in the future in a direction that everyone can be proud of and if you had that much control and that much power and that much say and you were complaining about losing a belt uh, a fake belt in a fake sport in a city because because it was Canada that caused all this heat and this huge rift in wrestling. I thought maybe if that didn't happen and Brett and Sean were friends or a tag team or, or had become uh, the click and Brett was part of the click instead of being uh, basically exiled from that group of guys and then having to go to WCW and deal with a bunch of other guys like Hulk Hogan and Ric Flair and whoever else Brett wasn't really keen on uh, working with or talk shit about or whatever. And, um, it, it affected the unity of the family and Davey and Jim went to WCW and I think they weren't protected and without the WWE structure and discipline those guys got into shit uh, more shit than they should have and their legacy was definitely tarnished by that and uh, Davey boy made that comeback to go to WWE which was cool with The Rock and he had a couple of things when he came back in the, in the pants and the boots and the tank top and um, that was at the end of his career but I mean if you think about how things could have went I always thought it would be really cool if they had been friends and it went back to the Jim Cornette quote just that I didn't I didn't know what I was talking about and uh, the ring of honor stuff I always kept doing backflips to get a, a pop I didn't my pop is my pop I don't remember much of what happened there and the backflips were basically just me saying thanks to the fans for booking me and uh, I couldn't really go off the top ropes because it was the, the way the platform was it was in my way so the only way to get up there and do it was off the top of the cage so and thank god my knees held up and I got to do that and if it, that's the worst thing I ever did in my career basically besides talk shit on some guys and I did some backflips in the ring I never heard a guy in my career and I'm always proud of trying to be an innovator and a guy that cultivated young talent and found guys that were needing a break needing a place to stay needing food or uh, gym passes or they needed shoes or they needed new gear and I always tried to facilitate that and uh, be a sponsor for guys and um, wasted a lot of money we'll say or not wasted but spent a lot of money on other people to have a potential wrestling 
wrestling career and I don't need to say all their names on tape but uh, I've watched a lot of guys that I've helped influence make a lot of money now and some are grateful and uh, they say thanks and they send me back tickets and they send me back love and texts and uh, they, they have a lot of respect for what I did and I have other guys that kind of act like they barely knew me even though they were at my house and sleeping over and wanted to fuck girls and party and whatever and um, it's all about being grateful and if you can be grateful the guys that helped pave the way for you I'm always grateful that Brett was such a good role model for the stuff he was a good role model for like fans all over the world love Brett the Hitman Hart it made my job a lot easier traveling the world uh, even in jail uh, places where it could be scary uh, but I got to be Brett's nephew and because I was part of Brett's family and it was accessible on the computer to Google me or check me out and I was part of that uh, I was protected so I would say thanks to Brett for that and uh, wish he could have worked on some other things but nobody's perfect and I'm far from perfect and I've made a lot of mistakes in my career uh, so the internet says and uh, trying to change it I think I got a 10 year run left still um, my body's in good shape and trying to keep that heart legacy alive make sure my grandfather who did put uh, a lot of time energy and effort and love into wrestling and his family that the uh, heart name lives on and there's more people coming after us my schools reopened and uh, the new heart dungeons in uh, Hopefully we'll be working with CZW and GCW. I don't know what the split will be because they have their own internal conflicts, but I have my two schools that I'm supposed to do and uh, try to be the the guy my grandfather was where I have this house here in Philly now um, that I bring people to my house and they can sleep here and hang out here and train here and eat dinner here and uh, cultivate this, this art called professional wrestling and mold themselves into some kind of character that the whole world wants to see. And with Twitter and social media and uh, Facebook and the capabilities of, we'll say technology uh, every wrestler has a, 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 pr a pretty good chance of becoming famous and well known if he knows how to work the game right you mentioned like all the tough uh, uncles that you had Brett Owen uh, Davey Dynamite which one would you say is the toughest uh, of all your uncles? I would have to probably say tough question I mean I heard dynamite was pretty tough in his day but he didn't last so and um, I would have hate to see Davy boy get mad he was pretty strong but same with Jim Neidhart too I bet they both would have been pretty pretty tough if they got mad and I'm sure Brett was uh, was shoot not too bad a, a good amateur wrestler and probably pretty strong and all those years of wrestling I mean I'm sure he's developed a pretty good chin and it would be hard to knock any guy out that it's at least in my family because of I would think they're uh, they're training with my grandfather on their necks all those guys had big thick necks so it'd be hard to knock them out if I had to put one guy if I could say into the the whole group of the people I'd say probably Harry Smith if I could go for all my uncles and nephews I'd probably think Harry Smith would be the toughest out of all of them now and uh, I think he'd be the toughest because of all the shoot fighting he's done and um, going through his dad dying and having to go to WWE and deal with a lot of those those guys trying to be tough guys and I remember JBL kind of took some cheap shots at Harry in a match one time and I'm pretty sure Harry uh, in a ring with no rules or in a street fight would fucking rape Justin Bradshaw pretty badly even though he was supposed to be so tough I saw him in the brawl for all and he didn't look like he was that badass at all and that's just that's the same thing coming from a 195 pound guy it's like maybe he's maybe he was a tough guy and if he got a hold of you good but I mean if you get punched in the face a couple times by a guy that's even 190 195 and your teeth are getting fucking knocked out of your mouth or you're getting eye gouged or something because it's not some wrestling match where you got a referee and uh, or MMA with gloves on and a breaks and the mouth guard and shit I'm not bite you just as you can bite me or I'll fucking pull you in the eyes you can poke me in the eyes but it's a different type of fight and uh, I think sometimes guys take liberties in wrestling and act like they're tough when uh, some of the toughest guys in the world in wrestling supposedly the brawl for all exposed how tough they really were and most of those guys got fucked up Dr. Destiny Williams was fucked up uh, Bradshaw got fucked up but Billy Gun or Bart Gunn was supposedly like an unknown guy and he seemed to be pretty tough and he got fucking killed by Butterbean and I mean I don't I've heard Butterbean throws a pretty hard punch but I mean I don't know how tough Butterbean is either, but I mean, again, maybe tough is not the uh, is not the right word of timing and when and where it happened and uh, different times of their careers, they might have been a lot tougher at one time than they were at another time based on injury and travel and wear and tear. So, I mean, I would have I would have thought Dynamite was probably juiced up. Uh, 
you know, and had a temperament kind of like that weird temperament it was probably pretty badass. But I mean, Chris Benoit is not one of my uncles, but he's definitely family. Uh, he would have been pretty tough too, I bet. So I mean, it's a that's a that's a good question, and I can't really say for sure who I who I think would. I think out of the hand speed, I think I always have the best hand speed as being a boxer and uh, in boxing and being a loudmouth in bars, I guess, and not even a loudmouth, but a guy that's controversial enough to wear fucked up pajamas or wear jewelry or bring a cat in a club. Uh, I always thought my hand speed is pretty fast. I've never been knocked out and I've had enough fights on the street to, to know what it's like and it's not fun. And I've been in jail uh, combined for about a year and a half. Not not the longest time, nothing like MVP or anything like that. Hats off to MVP, MVP for being able to stay in jail that long and come out alive and motivated to do something with his career. Conan explained to me how much time he did in jail I never knew. So as a guy that I met a couple times and seemed to be kind of uh, a prick and then the last two times I saw him was really cool and really nice guy and I heard his story and got a lot more respect for him. So I didn't know mean to go all over with the questions but And who would have been your favorite wrestler growing up that you'd look up to? Um my grandfather uh, was someone I always looked up to, but he wasn't really a wrestler at that time. It was more just the figure and the promoter and the the man himself and the the uh, the workhorse. But my dad, another guy, uh, always looked up to my dad as a legend. Even though he wasn't a wrestler, he did a little wrestling. But uh, his work ethic in the gym and his business acumen and uh, education and uh, ability to save money and take care of my mother and uh, to raise a family and lose my lose his son at a young age when he was. 13 years old my brother died of flesh eating virus so that, that that fucked up our family and fucked up my dad pretty crazy and um but i, I guess the question would be more for the wrestling part of it i think uh i like brett a lot but davy boy spent more time with us than brett did because harry was in my closer to my age and brett's kids weren't really doing much with wrestling so and harry was already starting to wrestle like seven eight nine years old and davy would still show up and do practices with us and uh, bring us gear and take us out for dinner and stuff he was at diana uh, being a sister where Julie was not not a sister she was married in uh, Diana still hung out a lot more with my mom and uh, the family I think the scheduling was the way it was with Brett who was busy and he had his own house and his own stuff Davey obviously had his own house and his own stuff but it was he lived closer to where my grandfather was so he showed up a lot more probably see Davey boy at that that time would probably be the one I looked up to the most um, just because he was so big and he, he started off very small and he got so big in the gym by working out so hard and eating so much and uh, people that have no idea unless you're a bodybuilder like Brian Cage uh, absolute fucking stud and more respect for Brian Cage than almost any wrestler in the history of the world for how big he got and how good he looks and how he can move so fast because I've been trying to get big for years and I've gotten big a couple times where I don't even get to do a video or many matches and I'm looking pretty good and then like one little injury nothing like major but like a chest pull or a bad back for a couple weeks or like your knee gets fucked up a little bit where you can't do as much in the gym for or you travel or go to rehab or jail or whatever the story or excuse is it's very hard to maintain size and maintain a, a, a busy wrestling schedule really tough so were you around for that uh, incident I guess you would have been pretty young still when Davey had an issue with one of the dungeon trainees and he came down and pretty much kicked the shit out of him um, do you know which time that was it with Carl the Duke it was around the time Carl the Duke was there. I was there, yeah. That was, uh, that was, I think, that James Trouble guy. I'm not sure who, there's a couple different times, but I think Davey snatched one guy pretty good in the dungeon. And uh, again, like I said, I hate to see Davey get mad. I heard some stories of Davey being pretty, pretty strong on and throwing some guys like one, two, three kids at Davey Boy. I think there was a fight with Davey and Sean and the one, two, three kid was there. Some guys outside a bar. I think that's when Shaw got jumped or something like that. And I guess Davey was fucking throwing guys over cars and shit. And, you know, yeah, and he wasn't in it, like, he had yeah. been partying at that point. Yeah. So he wasn't, like, he super was fresh. Yeah. yeah. I mean, he probably had a couple drinks in him. So, I mean, imagine if he was sober and fucking. I, I mean, again, those guys, each one has their own their own mystique. And uh, most wrestlers are pretty tough in general. I think they have to be. If and Once they've been in the ring for a while and they've been on the road for a while, they get a lot tougher. Uh, but again, I mean, street fight is different than uh, MMA rules as different than sucker punching some drunk fan in the bar or being a bouncer like I hear the stories about all these bouncers back in the Minnesota days how tough they were I heard Rick Rude was super tough 
And I heard a story about Rick Rude. Uh, Lanny Poffo said that Rick Rude knocked out both the Steiner brothers back to back with like one punch each or something. And I, I don't know the validity, I don't know the truth of it, but it sounded like from my gathering of information over the years that Rick Rude was supposed to be one of the toughest guys ever because uh, of his fucking forearm strength and his fists and his hand speeds. I mean, a good punch in the head is going to knock anyone out, you know, or give, rock you pretty good. And if that's, if that's, if that's your thing and you're sucker punching guys and wrestling and stuff, and I guess Dynamite was a master of giving sucker punches. He sucker punched one of the Rougeau brothers, supposedly, and that's what caused that whole thing. I mean, he could be super tough, but if uh, you sucker punch the wrong guy, like a Haku, and Haku turns around and fucking he's pissed off, he wants to take a Nash train, gouge your fucking eye out of your head, that, that goes to another level of, like, tough and crazy and, like, you know, barbarian, warlord, Haku, some of these guys, each one of those guys, I imagine, would be probably pretty tough in their prime. They're huge, even, like, Hacksaw, Jim Duggan, I bet, back in the day, these are all big 250, 260, 270 pound guys. Like, I wouldn't want to see one of those guys jump on you uh, and bite you or fucking try to stick their fingers in your mouth or eyes or up your ass or in your nose or whatever. Fucking, they'd be all scary. So, I mean, think about some of the guys in wrestling over the years. Like, fucking, I heard Andre the Giant was super tough too, but I heard Bad News Allen kicked Andre the Giant in the head on a bus for calling him a uh, racist name. But, I mean, I don't know. I wasn't there for a lot of the stories. I heard a cool story about Flash Funk. Uh, kicking the shit out of Hawk on the runway in Korea and I heard that from a couple different guys that that was a shoot Scorpio story Scorpio Sky stuff, yeah. beat the shit out of him I mean and Hawk was supposed to be pretty tough but I mean I, who knows if that's a Hawk gave uh, Macho Man a swirly at one point they had a fight in Japan and Hawk beat the shit out of Macho, Macho Man, Man really? and shoved his head in the toilet see I had never heard that one yeah. either see I mean it goes I, I've heard lots of different stories that's the first time I heard that one so um, but yeah I mean wrestling wrestling yeah uh, it's a funny dynamic with guys traveling together so much and like doing drugs and partying and fighting over girls and a push and characters that are not real but you're uh you're still living in a world where even though it's not real in one life or not one part of your life's not real it becomes real on the other end and then some of these guys take their characters pretty fucking seriously so and for those that don't know your mom is georgia hart who is uh a grand or a daughter of Stu, and your dad was a wrestler on a few occasions, but he was mainly a firefighter and he operated the gym that everyone trained at. Yeah, and was an agent for uh, a lot of hockey players and athletes from Russia, and um, he worked at the WHL and the NHL for a while. They created a company called PSS, Professional Sports Services. And uh, my mom was the one that usually did all the Sunday dinners and kind of, she's the glue that kept the family together, I think, and made sure that everybody uh, was fed and the house, was, the house was clean and the animals were taken care of. My grandfather was always watched over and uh, my grandmother was taken to jazzercise and that she was, you know, not stuck with the, the burden of all those cats and dogs and the dinners and stuff that my mom helped balance out the, the workload at the at the hard house because it was a big it was a big operation to keep all those different people and fans and friends and family and nephews and nieces and grandkids all coming through the house and uh, giving them a safe fun place to stay and you lived in actual you lived in the gym which was a nice gym, yeah but you were actually in a slum like literally with prostitutes yeah. outside of your door crackheads yeah everywhere. tons of tons of drug addicts I live the people don't realize that too I, I grew up uh, in like a really bad ghetto area even though my property was nice inside was like a heaven compared to the outside which was hell but that gave me uh, gave me an appreciation for how lucky uh, I was personally to be uh, blessed with good parents and to have uh, a good moral standing I've done some fucked up shit but nothing too crazy based on uh, and that's the thing if people think Teddy Hart's crazy it's like uh, if doing mushrooms or smoking weed was crazy uh, then I guess that's crazy but I've never smoked crack once I've never done a line of coke I've never done crystal meth I've taken I think like one one Tylenol or a couple Tylenols in my life I've never taken painkillers I broke my ankle I haven't been injured too many times in wrestling but I broke my ankle broke my leg ruptured my Achilles tendon and I finished the match and never took a pill like Tyson Kidd same thing I don't think he ever touched a fucking pill even when he broke his neck and went through all the surgeries and stuff like that just tough mentally tough same with Jack Evans mentally tough and uh, maybe not the biggest guys in the world but uh, 
from what I can say, like for what the mark of a man is of test of pain or injury, Jack Evans, I've watched him break a leg and finish a match. I've watched Tyson Kidd break his neck and walk out of the ring and drive himself to the fucking hospital. Not that I watched it, but him telling me his firsthand information, my best friend telling me his story, that's that's out of the horse's mouth and he doesn't ever he never lies. He doesn't have time. So I mean I've I've uh I've grown up in an area where empathy and understanding for for uh, a, a homeless guy um, is huge. I think the homeless guy could be like the Beauty and the Beast test. If you see him as just a bomb piece of shit, you can't even give him five bucks, and you got a hundred thousand bucks in your pocket of marijuana money or from uh, steroids and weed and a wrestling school. You know, I used to make a lot of money, not as much as obviously The Rock or Cena or any of these guys, but I lived a pretty good lifestyle for 15 years, and I had as many outfits as Ric Flair had robes, and I had time on my hands, which they never did. I always looked at my watch, and Randy Orton said something about he had a Bentley in his garage, but he barely ever got to drive it. And I've had almost every car you could have from uh, Maseratis to Jaguars to, um, you know, souped up Jeep Grand Cherokees with fucked up engines and like uh, done it all for what I could do. But I had time to drive, time to enjoy, time to see my wife. If my cat was with me, it was with me six days a week where Tyson Kidd gets to see his animals maybe two days a week. So um, or I think have the, other people chauffeur you around. Like I yeah, or, or, or I had a lot of chauffeurs and stuff too, which was always cool. But I mean, I did that on Street Hustle and I did that because I think I understood the way uh, the way of taking care of the little guy on the bottom and understanding of some poor homeless guy has a story and listen to his story without wasting too much time gathering information from from uh, sources of uh, poverty or uh, bad luck or whatever but everyone's got a story and if you can learn from the guys on the bottom and be, be nice to them I think they provide you with a blanket of protection in the future and I've been in some really shitty situations where I don't know how I came out alive in different neighborhoods where I was stuck trying to get weed late at night and on the road and should have got jacked or ripped off or fucking stabbed or shot and um God protected me and I always thought the reason God protected me was because I was a nice person to people and that's the thing Teddy Hart gets a stigma for is sometimes I think I'm an arrogant asshole or a prick or stuck up. I earned my own money from the street. Uh, I spent a lot of time on the street. I sold a lot of weed to people uh, instead of selling coke or meth or crack to people which for price per capita, price per gram is you make a lot more money selling shit stuff to people and misery than you do selling good and if marijuana is the worst thing I've ever done now the whole world smoking and weed, it's you know, be it's going to be legal in Canada, and, and WWE, I think, should look at that again, and if Florida's got uh, marijuana rules, I think the WWE's become a little more lax on guys getting a medical marijuana license in the state of Florida, and they can smoke if they pay their fines ahead of time, so I hope that helps get guys off the pills, or painkillers, and, uh, or alcohol, yeah, alcohol's the worst, man, I can't even imagine, because I can't smoke weed right now, I'm on probation, I have to pretend to drink this beer here, um, and it's just the only thing I can do is uh, is basically like smoke a cigar and I have this has been like almost this is a year and a half of not smoking weed for me and I don't feel my body's healing as much and I don't heal my workouts aren't as good uh, I'm having trouble eating so I go back to the marijuana I think is an essential part of uh, if you are a smoker and you know why you smoke and you're an athlete, you smoke for these reasons, to meditate, relax, and to heal. And those are all things I still stand by and I wish I could go back to smoking marijuana. But uh, I'm proud of myself to not. Dude, this, is the, this is the longest I've ever gone without smoking and uh, I really don't drink much anyway so it wasn't a huge big deal to not be able to drink alcohol but it's like... Uh, when you're dealing with probation and cops and that, and we go back to the question of like did you grow up in a bad area with a lot of like weird things and homeless people and just, was it yeah they, they made me tough they made me understand they made me love and they also made me learn about what probation was because I'd hear they're on probation or they've been charged or what happens once you've been in that situation or you've gone down that side called the dark side of life and uh, man it puts like a stigma on you and it's like a burn like a tattoo because people look at you differently when they when you say you've been in jail or you've been charged or they go on the computer and some girl last night googled me and she was like oh you have sexual assault charges I said yeah but I can't stop someone from charging me but I can definitely show you the answer to the question which was was I guilty no did I beat it yes when I got a DUI did I take responsibility for it sure was I drunk no was there alcohol in my system absolutely not I was drugged and I said that from day one but the only way to get off probation instead of waiting for a trial which would be another year away based on how busy the Texas courts were I would have had to wait so 
I plea bargain out, I'll accept guilt for that because it's adjudication. After it's done, then it's off my record. If I do three years probation, it's off my record. After, I'll take the say, I'll take the uh, the charge as this is what happened. But some of the shit on the internet bothers me because it doesn't it doesn't come off right away. You see it, and you don't if you don't read if you don't read enough. And a lot of guys just jump to the conclusions where they just read the first two pages of the book. And the book's fucking like saying this guy's a piece of shit or a murderer or this guy's a sexual rapist or a demon. It's like, man, that's never been me. But if you read the end of the book, then you find out the truth, which is the guy beat it. He beat it. He beat it. He lost maybe half the shit he ever had. All the all materialistic stuff that I earned and worked for and got from my wife and from all the years of wrestling and training and uh, and selling weed and, and being a, we'll say like a, a type of gypsy guy I am and many different businesses selling cats and running a school and opening a gym and doing clothing and uh, clothing line for strippers and stuff like that all the whatever I can do to make money uh, all taken away from me based on some bullshit that I had a sexual assault charge from my wife and girlfriend which wasn't printed and I got Rolling Stones magazine supposed to be a great got an awesome opportunity to be in Rolling Stones magazine it turns out to be kind of a smear campaign on me because the guy didn't like the uh, the way the finish was, which was me going to Mexico and Conan claiming there was a press conference out of nowhere, then he knew I was already fucking basically 10 hours away and I couldn't get there in time. And uh, another guy, Conan, I love him, but always sees things one way and uh, thinks he's exactly right. And it's like maybe your mind or your memory is not quite as sharp as you think it is on certain things and you say something and then you bury me and then it's like politically cool to be a anti Teddy Hart guy. But yet I'm the first guy in your house, uh, if it's Christmas or you need a cat, something like that or you need a friend and you're sick and nobody wants to drive you to the hospital I'm the first guy waiting for you because I think of us I think of my relationship with certain guys uh, outside the ring as I'm their friend on the street and in the ring they talk a certain way about Teddy Hart because it's cool to be like oh that Teddy's crazy or that guy's this it's like Teddy Hart's a guy you could call four in the morning reliable enough to pick you up at the airport pick you up off the street change your flat tire help you to the hospital watch your wife and wait with her and never be a pig or a pervert or a piece of shit or a danger around your kids and carry around a cat this whole time to show people of like you know how much work it is to carry a cat around everywhere and change its litter and keep its fur clean its eyes clean and make sure that cat's actually trained enough to be uh, considered fun it's not like some fucking cats around it's scratching everyone and running around pissing and you're like where's that cat it's like under the table one minute and it's over here another minute it's like it's never been a headache the cat was a d basically to me it was an idea of showing people um, I'll take an extra job on because if you don't like me then you might like the cat and if the cat gives you five minutes to come back interact with me and get to know how I think and uh, how I interpret half the shit that's being said to me or about me or the way I really uh, want fans to see me as a good guy and because of the truth not because I want you to I want to be the good guy I'm a fucked up person I have a fucked up way of looking at things like I say with aliens conspiracy theories my religious views on stuff uh, just like I, I see things differently than a lot of people. I'm not asking you to agree with me, but listen to me most of the time. I'm educated enough to back up what I think or show you stuff on Google that at least is factual to say this is where I got my information from and, and go from there. So, But my shoot interviews, like I say, half the time when I talk, it's like one question turns into five other things. And I try to go back to the question again. And I think it was more along the lines of like my neighborhood and uh, growing up in a shitty area uh, with a lot of bad people. Uh, bad people aren't bad people. They're bad situations. And a lot of bad people are actually good people as long as you give them a chance to talk. And, and they're not trying to steal from me or trying to kill me. A lot of people, uh, I grew up with prostitutes, a lot of prostitutes. Some of the nicest people I met were prostitutes and the most understanding people. And if they talked to me about taking care of some guy who's uh, down and out on his luck, but he's got money. And I said, well, what's down and out on his luck? His wife died or his, he's... Uh, trying to fight a demon and like what's a demon and they said well he's a pedophile or a child molester but he doesn't want to be one and I said that's fucked up how do you know that she's like well because we talk to these guys a lot it's not just sex in a room it's a therapist talking to these guys and I always thought that was weird and then I opened up an escort agency years later and sometimes my wife would tell me about calls these girls had or they'd have to write notes down and they'd give the notes to the police about these guys and most of the guys were just lonely guys looking for someone to talk to and uh, and sex is obviously something we've all we all deal with as being humans and um, it, it's it's a type of therapy and I always thought that was a funny thing because I always got a stigma back in the day of guys picking up hookers were filthy fucking pieces of shit or guys that were you know dealing with escort agencies or going to massage parlors were bad guys and then you realize half the world's been uh, 
doing this for 500 years or a thousand years and escorts are the oldest profession on earth for a reason and sex is a way of getting people to get along i'd rather see a bunch of people fucking than killing each other and speaking of your uh, wrestling career you had numerous trainers uh, do you want to just go through some of them you mentioned yeah. TV already? Uh, Leo Burke was my very first coach, really, that helped me get uh, a certain style and understand psychology and was a phenomenal human being, super nice guy, Brett's trainer. Uh, he did the WWE Dojo stuff, and that was with like Ken Shamrock and uh, Andrew Martin, which was Test, and Christian, and Mark Henry, and... Uh, there was Brockus. Yeah, Brockus was there, Alcum Albright, and Kurgan was there too back in the day. And like uh, Edge was there. I didn't really see Edge though, but he was in Calgary at the, like, up and down during those that time. There was a lot of guys that came through Calgary after for WCW, but none of them actually made it to the WCW. Brett ran two schools, one for WWE when he was there, and then one after for WCW, a small one. And uh, a lot of guys from the WCW school didn't quite get their break. It was kind of like the power plant, and they, Brett had it in Canada after Vince let him go or whatever that the situation was in Montreal but uh, that thing didn't really turn out to be too too successful I trained with Bruce obviously and uh, Ross and I don't know if Ross and Bruce taught me that They're much Brett's brothers just yeah Brett's brothers them. Ross and yeah Brett Hart and uh, Bruce Hart and Ross Hart were uh, Brett's brothers sorry Cody I gets me sometimes I'm saying names without saying who they were because people don't know them but they were, they were good. They ran a tight program, but they they did a lot of kind of chicken shit stuff to me, Tyson Kidd, and uh, to Harry Smith and Jack Evans. They didn't put us on TV a lot, and they cut matches out and wouldn't let our spots be done. Or if they did, they would put us on like first match and like try to kind of job us out or keep us uh, looking like it was like a. Uh, like a novelty act with some kids running around when the fans took it pretty seriously and I think we could have had a lot more success in wrestling uh, overall if the hearts had got behind us more at the at a younger age instead of just being Diana and my mom and dad kind of pushing us into wrestling and uh, Brett was kind of helpful sometimes but again he was so busy with what was going on in his career I don't think he had too much time to take care of his own kids and take care of his own family issues let alone help out me Harry TJ and uh, Jack came after that obviously with Matt Rats and um, who else kind of trained me was basically like I think myself and uh, I'd watch all the guys on TV like watching you know let's just say like watching Shawn Michaels Shawn Michaels helped train me even though I was never in a ring with him uh, I watched him for years and I had a place to go practice what he was doing on TV or I'd watch Tiger Mask or I'd watch Dynamite or I'd watch Benoit um, I'd watch Rey Mysterio Jr. and then we'd try to copy what they did and, and, and modify it a little bit or you know I was a wrestling historian for videotapes and watching stuff and learning um, trampoline helped train me gymnastics helped train me uh, you know, a lot of a lot of guys like Arnold Schwarzenegger pumping iron, saying he's smoking weed and working out to help train me. You know, you learn your stuff uh, from consider the source theory of whatever the source of information is. Watch what they did and how they did it, and if it sounds like they're successful, it seems like they, what they did was a uh, was accurate. Then you could copy it and change it a little bit to suit your style of living. And every character is different, every man's different, but the information is usually the same. It's all about hard work, dedication, consistency, and behavior. And uh, those those are things that can make you a huge huge success in whatever uh, endeavors you choose. And you've mentioned you were training with TJ. Uh, for those who don't know, you, you were friends with TJ from school or something, yeah, right? Yeah, from grade four on. And I helped Tyson Kidd. Uh, Tyson Kidd is a guy that I always... He didn't need to learn much uh, for me, he would learn what not to do more than anything. He was so smart. He was one of the sharpest guys I ever met. And even to this day, I think he's the sharpest guy I have ever met overall. Besides, uh, my dad's pretty smart. And the education-wise, good memory, great speller. But for the education Tyson Kidd had, his brain, his memory, um, his the thought process and free choices that he made were always the smartest. And um, it proved that, that he's a millionaire and he never fucked up man because he was smart he knew what to do and how to play the game and what happened with his neck was obviously complete bullshit and i, I don't think anyone ever i don't think anyone could ever uh, argue with that that he's probably the toughest guy in the world to be able to go back in and watch a bunch of guys do what he was doing and he was doing a better job than most of those guys ever were and wasn't getting recognized for it then finally near the end we started to get that push and that understanding and the respect that he was better than benoit i think and better than owen was and better than dynamite and a 
tiger mask and never cheated on his wife once, never smoked a cigarette, never fucking maybe had a beer in his life or two, nothing. I mean, one of the most clean cut, straight edge, good people, solid guys you'll ever meet. I trust him with my family. My son uh, looked up to Tyson Kidd and considered him more of a dad type of character because he was going to visit my son even when, and I hadn't seen my son in 15 years. And don't get me wrong, I paid all my child support up front. I never miss a child support payment. Just my lifestyle uh, for a five-year-old, seven-year-old, ten-year-old to see a guy with multiple girlfriends smoking marijuana constantly, uh, wearing fuck up pajama suits and crazy outfits and stuff. I and did not want my son to ever be a wrestler. I wouldn't wish it on my worst enemy. I tell people I would not wish. Uh, don't don't be a professional wrestler unless you really want to be a professional wrestler and you've decided that's what you want to be. I run a school and I'd love to take your uh, take your potential and make you into a star and help you live your dream and take your money and use it to buy a bunch of stuff for 15 other guys that want to live in a cool house and experience the uh, the allure of being a potential superstar but the actual schedule and the guarantees and the no insurance and no dental and uh, limited jobs fuck yeah I wouldn't wish it on my worst enemy I wish I part of me wishes I wasn't a professional wrestler if I go back in time I wish I would have done something else a lot I sit in my bed and lonely at night um, after multiple failed marriages because of my travel or not marriages but like my girlfriends are basically wives to me that have had a couple serious five-year relationships that were basically that's my wife and uh, one of my girlfriends died I don't know if you remember Nikki she just OD'd on heroin and uh, crystal meth I think I'm not sure exactly what the details were but she was in Mexico with me for a couple of years and one of the things I prided myself on was I'd done certain drugs but one of them was never crystal meth or coke and those drugs are really bad and most drugs are bad and most things done in uh, in moderation can be tolerated and uh, most things done uh, you know we'll say uh, with that maniac style uh, you're gonna fucking have uh, maniac results which are fucking death and destruction and she OD'd and that was a girl I spent a lot of time with trying to get clean same thing with my wrestling school uh, a lot of the guys I have I see them down the road after and uh, they either became cops or they got into drugs and it's like weird because it was like one or one one option or the other because the the heartache of not being a professional wrestler either provides a discipline that you learn from the school how to be tough and take bumps and how to live a certain lifestyle or you watch the other part of it and you got into really crazy shit because you thought that's what professional wrestling allowed you to be was a party animal and that's not that's not how I, that's not how I taught my school but I mean you can't prevent someone after they've been out of your custody what they're gonna do with their life is up to them now as good as a wrestler as you are from what you've told me and Harry and TJ, your brother was actually an amazing wrestler. Yeah. Can you tell the story of what happened with him? Um, it's a it's a tricky one. They don't know if it was from a dirty wrestling mat or if it was just like bad luck. That might have been like uh, he might he got hit in the chest or something, and that could have caused it too. Some kind of like weird. Uh, like, I, don't know, I guess it like bruised his lung or something, but that might have caused it to happen. But he ended up getting staph infection and turned out, and then from there, I think it blew up into flesh eating virus. And he was a phenomenal person, too. My brother was uh, a real gentleman, very humble, quiet kid. Uh, every parent's dream woke up in the morning, no complaints. I'm a whiner, spoiled type of kid, a little bit, you know, problems in school and telling teachers to fuck off and. Uh, you know, doing little pranks and vandalizing certain things and shit, you know, like a troublemaker type of guy. And he was the complete opposite. And uh, good friends with Tyson Kidd, very good friend. And same with Harry, obviously family with Harry, but they were very close. And uh, he was uh, he was such a nice guy and worked so hard at being a wrestler. He loved wrestling and took it so seriously. And for him to have to die the way he died, I think... Uh, it, it really destroyed a lot of people in our family. It, it was hard on Brett, I know that, just because I think Brett, uh, very close to my mom, Brett, and Brett knew that it destroyed my mom and dad, so I think that was one of the things uh, he was, I saw Brett emotionally troubled by that one. You sometimes see a lot of these guys and they don't have any emotion, they, you can't see it at least because they're, they're good at hiding it, but uh, my brother's death affected my parents huge and uh, it sort of made me not believe in God for a couple of years. 
And I went down a pretty dark path during those years because I was mad at God, I was mad at the world for taking my brother away from me and then doing it in, such a, in a, such a shitty way. He got chopped in half, basically. They amputated both his legs uh, and uh, both his arms from gangrene underneath the underneath the elbow. And my dad, my poor dad, was trying to stay motivated, picking out the, out of a magazine that he had found or a book they'd given him on prosthetic limbs and the future of prosthetic limbs. He was trying to sell me on that maybe your brother can still wrestle in the future if he's not brain dead because he'd been in a coma and they didn't know if he was going to be able to think after if he did beat it. They were hoping he was going to beat it. They were optimistic. Obviously, you're optimistic every day until something you know really bad goes through which is either the verdict of here he's dead or there is he's got brain damage or we're gonna you know and uh, it was I guess it was the blood the blood flow and the lack of circulation caused uh, the swelling to be so crazy that he had like 60 pounds of water a day on him so when I saw him he was like a balloon his face was like this his whole body was like black black arms black hands his fingers were all dried up and uh, TJ and I walked into the hospital and I said this in another interview I think one time but we were both pretty mentally tough guys we, been, we both grew up in a shitty area and uh, walked the streets all the time and thought we were pretty tough you know little badass kids and I remember both of us looked at each other and we were so scared after that and it was it was ruthless man I felt so terrible I couldn't stay in the hospital I wanted to get out of there so bad I, my poor parents had to sit there every day and uh, Ross Hart was one of the only reasons that I say Ross has a full set of teeth in his mouth right now uh, because he did some shit to me over the years where I would have really hammered him. And uh, But he was so good to my brother and he stayed there the whole time my brother died. Watched him the whole time that he kind of got a blanket of protection and respect that I just said, listen, I'll always f overlook anything that Ross does. And uh, Bruce has a handicapped son named Rhett. And same thing with Bruce, had to deal with the terrible... Uh, terrible ramifications of dealing with uh, disability and cerebral palsy so Ross and Bruce for the two reasons that Bruce is a phenomenal father to, to Rhett and Ross was a great uncle to my brother that I forgave those guys for being assholes in, in real life to me and, and TJ and Harry and Jack in our wrestling careers so uh, but yeah like my brother if he would have lived I think he would have been uh, a huge superstar he was the type of uh, his attitude and I think his reliability would have been one of the guys that the WWE would have liked. He was more simple than I was. I'm too complicated and all over the place. And it's taken me years to get to a certain calm and inner peace in my spirit where it's like I feel calm now. Like there, Brad Pitt had a movie, Legend of the Falls, maybe I think it was, or something like that, where he was like real crazy for like the for a long time, and then at the end he comes back after everything, and he's like more calm. And uh, they kill his wife, I think, or something like that during them picking up some liquor from uh, like bootlegging days or something. He has a native wife at that time. I think that's the movie it is. But and uh, I felt like that character where I was real, real fucking crazy and wild and uh, upset with the world and mad about not being on TV and not bitter. Well, I won't say bitter, but frustrated and uh, trying to prove myself and wondering how much more I could do and if I climb off another cage is it going to make a difference? But I still did it. Balls and respect and uh, thinking my brother up in heaven would at least be watching me and uh, that if I didn't make an opportunity that he got no chance to ever live he never had a chance to do it at least I can't quit I gotta take it at least as far as I can and try to go as hard as I can for as long as I can to try to see if there's still some silver lining at the end of the day that maybe I get my break and I get a chance uh, to still be on TV or uh, internet TV becomes so popular that I think it's four or five million people watch me on YouTube now so I can at least say I'm somewhat famous and I go to places where like wrestling conventions and uh, WrestleManias and way more people seem to know me than I thought they did so that's pretty cool and I hope my brother's in heaven proud of at least the fact that I always thought I did some of the best moves and had the biggest balls in wrestling and uh, uh, loved to help out other people that had talent and watch guys grow and try to try to like, you can't live up to you can't like my grandfather you can't I can't be my grandfather and I can't be my brother but I, I thought they'd be proud of me for still being here and, and, and not tapping out uh, in wrestling or in life because I mean every one of their deaths I'm the one that has to absorb it and I've been through a lot of shit and uh, every one of those deaths 
is like a chink out of your armor. The Benoit death was really hard. My brother's death. Uh, my best friend Andrew Kamel shot himself when I was uh, 18, right after I got my WWE contract. And no one really knew that one. It was, and I'd known him since I was five years old. And it was like uh, Owen, obviously Davey, my grandmother, my grandfather. Just like and everybody goes through it. Everyone has death happen to them, obviously. And it's nothing specific that I'm trying to use as an excuse. But uh, people that know about dealing with loss they understand that the comeback is hard and the motivation is tricky and being locked up in jail or going to rehab and uh, trying to come back after that. I guess why Rocky Balboa said that both the, it's not what you do when you get knocked out, it's what you do when you get up and you got to keep moving forward. And uh, I don't think I've ever been knocked out in life, but I've been knocked down, but I've always gotten up and tried to step up and make uh, a positive push in the right direction. And not just for me, but for people that believe in wrestling and want to be part of my school or part of my group or uh, uh, as an influential person uh, on these shoot interviews, as a guy that motivates people to never stop, never quit, never uh, never say die attitude, and that if Teddy Hart can still go and climb to the top ropes and motivate myself, that you, you the fan watching me, is that important because your job is even harder than my job. I did construction for three months, and I've never had a nine to five job before. I did dishwashing for like a week one time. I, I washed cars at a car wash for like a fucking summer once, and man, I woke up every day at six in the morning for a month in the hot sun in Tampa and I have never ever experienced a feeling of fucking hell like a guy that works a nine to five job every single day and hats off to every guy that's got a full-time job that wakes up in the morning that takes a train or gets in a car and has to start that car up and he knows he's got 35 years at that job to continue paying for his kids education his house his fucking his lifestyle and that's all he has and half the jobs these guys have suck and they're not happy with the job but they got to look in the mirror every day and find motivation and then they go to the gym after work and then they go to their kids soccer practice or their hockey practice or their daughter's singing recital and then they got their wife on top of that they got to go balance the, the nine to five lifestyle the human what human beings have to go through in general I wouldn't even want to talk about what third world countries have to go through but from what I see in North America uh, to all the guys that buy the videos the average Joe guy the wrestling fan that is buying my shirt or buying the video or uh, clapping for me because I did a high spot or whatever I clap for you guys and that's no ass kissing phony baloney wrestler trying to get a promo of like you know when I say the name of the city I love Houston and we're in Houston and a bunch of fans it's a cheap pop my 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 thing is the the guys that do this and respect the world the way it works and make things work the guy that's at McDonald's the guy that's doing your fucking plumbing the guy that's your construction worker the guy that's paving your streets man every one of those jobs is hard and they're long boring tedious and there's not much reward and for what they do after which is love me and not be so mad I was so bitter and mad and furious that I had this job and I, even though I was getting paid I, it fucked me up so bad and then I looked in the mirror and really realized this was just a taste of what most people have to go through every day and that if I'm lucky enough to call myself a wrestler why am I a wrestler and why haven't I quit and how lucky I am to call myself a wrestler and actually have a fairly successful career where I make just enough money obviously I have other money and investments and things that have been passed down or inherited or because you know somebody that's got money you can get money from them but if what, I, what I did on my own steam and what I make on my own back is just enough to survive as a wrestler and uh, the respect of how hard it is to earn a dollar in this world right now man really the nine to five guy I take my hat off to you uh, like I can give you a hug and a kiss and say please don't quit uh, we need you guys to keep working your asses off and keeping the way the, they're the glue of the world they're the, the ones that keep the world going in that direction and their hard work and uh, their drive is unbelievable and a lot of people don't know about this but Shortly after your brother passed away, you, Harry, the WWE match in Vancouver. That was a reward sort of for getting back on the horse and still wrestling after my brother died. I think Owen helped organize that for us. Uh, we did a match before the show and uh, Vince watched it, Undertaker. I think a lot of guys like uh, in WWE had sort of seen us coming up and they... They were like very young at that time. Yeah, it was a really good match too. And they, they everyone was really cool. They sang our praises and understood the, the tragedy of my brother's death and they they gave us a little uh, a little rope to work with and we didn't hang ourselves with the rope we got we built a little package and uh, used the rope to climb across the bridge to the other side and that was uh, where Tyson kid got noticed and Harry got noticed and uh, 
I got a potential chance to do a backflip in front of Vince McMahon, which is always a, a big thing on my list that I at least got to wrestle in front of some of those guys once or twice in my career, even if it was when I was a kid. You were in Stampede Wrestling when it had this revival in the early 2000s, late 90s. Mauro Ranello was the commentator. He yeah. was also the commentator for Matt Ratz. Yeah. What do you think about that whole thing that recently happened in WWE with uh, Mauro and JBL? I, I wasn't sure what happened with it. Well, I, uh, yeah, it was just alleged bullying, what, what caused him to quit, and then eventually, I guess JBL's no longer working for the company. I don't know if it's just a coincidence, and Moro's back. Is Moro back with WWE again now? Apparently, yeah. Uh, see, I, I didn't know enough about that situation to really comment. I know Moro was... He lived in the Hart House for yeah, a long time, right? Yeah, he dated Jenny, and uh, he do, it was. I thought he was a very knowledgeable commentator. He knew every move and uh, was... was was quite amazing at what he did. I thought he was a great, a great guy. He helped me out and uh, was always nice to me. I knew he did some stuff with the UFC or with uh, Japan. I think with one of the shoot fighting companies over there with uh, Boz Rutten. I knew that about Moro, and I just, uh, I knew he had some problems with, uh, with like, not, we'll say not mental issues, but I think with depression and maybe uh, bipolar, bipolar or, something. or something like that. That he had some, he suffered from that. And he gave me some advice on. Uh, how to prevent that from happening in the future to me or if there was medication to take to look into it and stuff and uh, I don't think I suffered from that so I didn't really need to follow his advice but he was he was at least a nice guy to try to help me out and, and provide me information that was potentially uh, the framework for other people that have mental challenges or disabilities to uh, to not fall victim to that type of thing but I, I can't really comment on that the one thing I remember about Moro that's interesting looking back on it was when they brought in Don Callis and Joey Styles to do the commentary for Matt Ratz and Moro kind of was against that. He flipped out, remember that? Yeah, he flipped out. Yeah. You got a good memory. And at the time, I was thinking, who is this guy? But ultimately, at the end, Moro's had more success. I think he commentated the McGregor fight. Yeah. Yeah. So, you want to explain to us what Matt Ratz was? Because you had a great roster that's ended up, everyone's done pretty well on most yeah. of them. Yeah. Yeah, there was some really good guys. Rene Dupree made it on TV. Uh, Apocalypse made it as, what's his name in WWE? Uh, Vic, he's with Vic the Victor. Ascension. Yeah. Well, yeah, Rick Victor. Rick Victor, Rick. and uh, obviously Tyson Kidd, and uh, Harry Smith, Natalia, Jack Evans, um, myself. Hey, you've done a lot too, man. I was a big fan of yours, and I thought you were WWE bound for sure. And if things hadn't kind of weird shit hadn't happened to you, I think you'd have been a big star in WWE. But you're another one of those wild cards like me, where you're you're opinionated enough, and you're not a yes man. You're a, you're a yes man if it makes sense, and if it's the truth, they think you'll agree to it. But if it's not, you're not just gonna say yes and and tote the line of bullshit. And you're uh, you're a shoot tough guy. So when people put you in a spot, a lot of people I think are scared of guys that are potentially shoot tough and they don't even you know that you ever have to put your hands up or fight with them but they know that if they do try to fuck with you that you might kick their ass and i think that's the thing with people in uh wrestling is there's a lot of pussies in wrestling that think they're tough but they really i think deep down inside know they're not and they want to walk around tough and play tough but if you've got a really tough guy around who's actually shoot tough and, and trained as an amateur wrestler and is 250 260 yeah, not a guy you want to be locked in a jail cell with type of thing uh you can't mentally talk him into stupid shit because he might snatch you and I think that's probably prevented you from uh, being a more successful person. Obviously, you're pretty successful now because you're paying me to do an interview, and you're the, you're the one coming up and uh, enjoying the uh, the luxuries of being smart and connected and hardworking in the wrestling business, but not as a wrestler only, as a promoter and as a as a website guy, as a as a channel guy or podcast type of uh, scenario where there's a lot of facets to wrestling to make money in. And the smarter you are, the more you can use them, the better it is. And that was the whole thing with Matt Rats. It was a smarter, different way of doing something uh, and creating a young group of guys that potentially had a way longer uh, expiry date, we'll say. They could have got, if you get a guy in like a doctor, you start training a doctor at seven years old or 10 years old. By the time he's 20, if he's been doing medical stuff for 10 years, he's definitely going to have a leg up when he starts going to university on some guy that just got in there and that's his first year learning that stuff. And that was the premise with Matt Rats. Same with kids basketball or uh, amateur wrestling uh, with kids or football with kids is the younger the kid is the better the kid's gonna be when he gets older the more time and energy and consistent behavior consistent training and uh, that's the way humans work the more time you put into something the better you're gonna be at it And if you can train a kid and uh, put him on TV and make money with it then 
professional wrestling could look at that as an option and I thought we were good enough to definitely be on TV and the moves we did and the spots we did and the criteria for what good wrestling was Eric Bischoff was definitely a, a judge of good wrestling and he thought it was good enough to put his name on so and a lot of other people I think when you watch the videos would agree that there was some really good wrestling and mostly high flying uh, some obviously technical stuff but a really high speed uh, high energy wrestling with cool girls little young hot chicks all around the ring and like a rave type of atmosphere with a lot of music and a combination of different bands from MTV and uh, guys that were getting a push because the music represented the type of wrestler and because you liked that band you'd watch that wrestler MTV tried to copy it with Wrestling Society X it didn't work out but Vince has been doing that with music and wrestling ever since I think we were the people that came up with that concept or idea or definitely uh, were one of the first people that came up with that type of framework for these guys to copy in the future and one other thing that stands out for me from that time, other than that incident with Moro, was Eric Bischoff's speech to all of us, which I'm sure is funny because I've met Eric <coughs> since then, and when I brought up Matt Rats to him, he totally shuts it off. So I just find it funny. I remember he gave us like a 20 minute speech and said, they, they said everyone at WCW was too old that I was using. Well, now I'm gonna shock the world and I'm gonna have the young guys. And like, he was so confident in that speech. Remember he fell? <laughs> he fell right after making that speech too. He like slipped and fell on his ass. I don't know. I mean, Eric Bischoff was a cool guy in person when I met him. He was always nice, but I've, I've seen him at airports after that, and he was kind of a dickhead. I've talked to him a couple times after, and he saw, he seemed like an like, arrogant piece of shit, and uh, he had no idea that he even knew me or kind of act like a superstar. And I'm like, for whatever you did do in the business, and and whatever, uh, congratulations. And you did a lot of stuff and lasted pretty long. And I don't know whose money it was or who was actually in power, but for whatever your position was, hats off to Eric Bischoff for that. But as a as a person that I saw that was uh, credible and consistent over the years, sometimes you see a guy and he's like, hey, bro, how are you? He's really nice. And three years later, you see him and he's a superstar all of a sudden. Like, I think Eric Bischoff was nicer when he was a star or when he was supposed to be important and powerful. And then when he dropped off and he was basically nobody after that then he was acting kind of like he was somebody and i thought that was a fucking kind of a weird weird switch and he did ultimately fail wcw he was only actually beating wwe for a short period of time and he was only profitable for a short period of time he actually caused a huge amount of money lost to tna oh yeah and of course he was in charge of what? He fucked Matt Rats up. If we didn't have Eric Bishop, I think Matt Rats would have been way more successful. And he basically made me and my uh, partner, Grandma, and fucking headbutt each other on a couple issues and like different stuff that happened. And we rushed it because Bishop wanted to be involved or he wanted it to go a certain way. And before that, it was done with me and TJ and Graham. The three of us had a better mind for what we wanted than Eric Bishop jumping in last minute with Jason Hervey. I think those two guys both didn't, uh, they didn't know their their heads from their asses when it came to different wrestling scenarios and storylines and what was working and why we, why we were successful, why he liked it in the first place when he came in to watch, why he thought it was so cool, and then when he got involved and tried to change it, uh, it wasn't so cool after that. And I skipped over this accidentally, but you were actually the youngest person to ever be signed by WWE yeah. when you were 18. Can you tell us that story and why it didn't work out? I remember I showed up... Uh, Vince had a limousine pick me up at the airport in, uh, I think it was, pretty sure it was Connecticut. Maybe it was New York, and they drove me to Connecticut, but it's one of the two. I mean, this is years ago, and the night before, I choked on a piece of squid, and I was in the hospital all night, and I was only allowed, like, 13 breaths a minute. I remember for some reason, I remember the number 13 and I remember my brother's death was at 13 and I remember they said they were going to have to do surgery and cut my throat open because it had gone down my esophagus, not my windpipe. I think it was like some weird, I threw up and I choked and uh, for whatever reasons my dad thought I was being a pussy and he said to me, he goes, you're just scared. You don't want to get on the airplane and you haven't been training very hard and you're probably not going to get anything out of this contract or you're not going to get anything out of this opportunity but uh, shame and don't kill yourself when you come back he's like don't be you know don't don't let it fa affect you you know we, we're still helping you out and we're proud of you but I told my dad to fuck off and ate some mushrooms before I got on the airplane to tell you the truth I think I told this story one other time in a video and I'll at this stage don't really care but I, I had got my stomach pumped
pumped and they tried to pump, put me out three different times and the fourth time that they gave me anesthesia they had relaxed I guess they knocked me out but I wouldn't I couldn't stay under for some reason I kept kicking out of it and the fourth time they gave me so much anesthesia it was like the last time they could give me it if it didn't work I was gonna choke to death and it, it relaxed me and I guess my throat relaxed enough that the squid went through my body and went right through down and uh, they didn't have to do the surgery, so, but I had already had my stomach pumped, and they gave me like a bunch of stuff expecting the surgery. I couldn't eat for a couple of days, so I just like jumped on the plane the next morning anyway and ate some mushrooms. I remember puking off the side of the fucking uh, airport, sick and like high on mushrooms, basically walking into the airport. And everything was like flashing colors and weird like hallucinations, and I remember thinking, "Fuck, this is what a nightmare this is going to be." And I got to the WWE. Uh, wherever I got to the airport in Connecticut there's two like there was a girl in the limousine they picked me up with a girl and like they I don't know what their test was but they wanted to see like what my interests were and at that stage I wasn't interested in girls uh, more than anything I wanted to wrestle I was really excited about being there at that time and I went in there with uh with like a, the fear of death that I just walked through death, I choked and almost died and came out of the hospital and didn't give a fuck. And I remember three days later, I was the youngest guy in the world to ever sign. And I, I, work, I worked really, really hard at that time in those dojos that I bumped. Nobody could bump as much as me or as fast as me or do as many moves as me at that time that I thought in the world really, I was doing everything at 17, 18, I could do every move at that time. The front twisting, the shooting star, the back flips, back foot full twist. Um, before like a, some guy like Will Ospreay who comes in it's like it's 20 years later man and i haven't heard you shout out to any guys that you watched like uh, neville at least always sees me he's respectful jack evans the guys that innovated like the very first guys ricochet the very first guys ever to do like the 630 and like the 450 with a twist or like the back flip full twist like i think it was uh like I go back to like Jimmy Yang doing a backflip full twist or Blitzkrieg or like these guys or Kidman doing the shooting star or like and Mark Merrow and or doing like for Flash Funk doing the 450 like and I see these moves and the like guys are acting like nowadays like these guys are doing this shit and it hasn't been done it was like brand new it's been innovated I'm like this shit's been being done for 25 years there was guys like 35 40 years ago that were gymnasts that did wrestling stuff that were doing the same shit or even harder shit you just don't see it so I just thought at least for being me at Teddy Hart at that age, if I could go in and do every move that I'd seen done already on TV, basically and do them clean and then work hard and bump hard and make guys look good. I was also very small, so I had to make guys look good. And you're not going to muscle around a fucking 290 pound guy or like all these other guys that were there. Kurt Angle was there, Jeff Hardy was there, Matt Hardy was there, Sean Stasiak was there. Like there was Glenn Kulka, uh, Glenn Kulka Steve, Williams. Steve, uh, Steve Williams. There was a ton. Steve Carino. Dory Funk was running. Chris Daniels. The first ones they ever did. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, before the development so many yeah there's before the development system and I, I hit a home run in there and I got a job and came back and my dad was appalled that they had given me such a big contract and uh that I had no, no no brain for business, he said, and I would waste my money on marijuana and clothes. I bought so many clothes and marijuana, and then my dad got a hold of my money after that. And there was no testing at that time. No, it was then. awesome. And you could get GHB at the store, at the GNC, so it was legal, and I said this in videos before too. The GHB, whenever I got it at that stage, was legal. You could buy it right at the GNC, and it was to help you sleep. Steve Regal, another guy that plays uh, kind of a weird role when I see him in the future and he's all clean and he acts like he's I don't know what you're talking about it's like well I was fucking doing GHB in a room with you at 18 years old you're the one that took me to a fucking massage parlor and stuff like that so again and Regal might be upset and maybe it'll affect me getting a job or he won't watch me at PWG if I ever got to go to some of these other promotions because I said something in an interview that was true you know it's like he was my friend nice guy and uh, I really thought he was cool I saw him in the future and I asked him about something and he went right back to the office and told and then Natty came back to me and she said something to me and I knew Steve Regal was the one that went back and stooged me out to the office about me saying something about GHB it was like 15 years later to him and uh, and changed the story of course too so it wasn't accurate what I actually said to him wasn't what he said to Triple H or whoever he said it was to was he doing the camp at that time because I guess he he was he was wrestling in there trying to get I guess cleaned up and he was like one night he had his boots on backwards he had his boots on the wrong feet and uh, he told me to be careful and uh, he gave me good advice and don't don't do these things like he was a really nice guy one of the nicest guys I ever met when he was Steve Regal not trying to be a political guy in the WWE giving jobs out and 
and like being a what and they have I mean like Johnny Ace they say he's like a stooge type of guy they have to be that's their job is to report information back to the office so and like I've heard about Fit Finley being the same way Paul London told me a couple of stories of like I always heard these guys in real life were pretty cool and like Dean Malenko but when they became agents Jamie Noble all these guys who became agents they have a different role and their responsibility is is to basically be uh, you know they was well, not say tattletales but their jobs to talk about and report back to the office whatever they see right and, and, and like same thing with finishes and like the match structure and Harry was talking to me about this recently of how like fucked up these guys in WWE are that let the matches happen like they set up the matches to be the shits these matches suck all the time they're always the shits like the match setups always the same and I'm like I always wonder why they have this certain level of wrestling and then why they don't let these guys go out there and steal the show or like why doesn't El Generico as Sami Zayn get to do the brain buster on the turnbuckle or why doesn't Neville get to do the reverse 450 or why doesn't this guy get to do but I understand they're also trying to protect the product and get longevity out of all these guys that if you have your cars doing more stunts and tricks and stuff than they should be doing I guess you're going to have to replace your vehicles a lot sooner and the engine might wear out or your, your brakes might go so that might be your knees as like an analogy of your car as your body then you may you may have uh, more problems and the, the cars that you value and and consider like NASCARs or race cars, you can't have them racing this type of schedule if they're doing all these types of moves. Or so they, they try to give you a, a basically a instead of a, a we'll say instead of a silver color which is really shiny and everyone can see it coming they give you like a a light blue kind of color and that's it's it's still colorful enough to be entertainment but it's not what i it, it's not as much as it could be but then again they give you the less is more theory that less is more in wrestling so and steve regal at that time i go back to was was not a fan of the less is more stuff at that time he was telling me to like to do lots of cool shit and he was coming up with cool reversals and arm moves and like showing me all this English stuff and wrestling that I hadn't seen and it was trying to he himself was trying to do a lot more and then later I see him on TV and his style was he was better in the dojo half fucked up or whatever you'll say but he was creative and he was working with all these young guys and guys that were all hungry because every guy's trying to get a job and they all want to show off so that was like the best I'd ever seen him he was really entertaining uh, for how many moves he knew and that was like where I got a respect for Steve Regal as being one of the great wrestlers one of the great great technical wrestlers in the world and then I see him on TV years later and it was more of a generic bland style that I saw and I used to go back and watch Fit Finley stuff and I saw Fit Finley when he was a kid and it looked like he was better as a kid almost like working that old English style than he was when he was in the WWE or when he was in WCW and he was still really good then it's just like you when you start to study where they came from then you can see their history and I guess why they changed their style over the years and if it's to get a job or keep a job then they've got a job I never got and I guess that that makes them better than me at certain things but I just still think that less is more theory is kind of bullshit and that you could allow these guys to do uh, a lot cooler stuff and like that guys that set up the matches in the back are protecting their own legacy so to speak so they can almost look back and be like well I had better matches than these new guys it's like yeah because you designed your own match then and now you got an agent who's supposed to be some wrestling guru and he's not letting you do anything because he's setting up that simple basic baby blue match you know that's fucking just a, it's, and there's not really a challenge to that I remember you telling telling me quite a long time ago, about 10 years ago, that Steve Williams tested you in that dojo. Yeah, man, that was ruthless of him. And uh, he kept dropping me on my head and over and over again and giving me weird suplexes. And like, I guess he was, he wanted to see how tough I was. And I remember, um, at 170 pounds or whatever it was I'm, and I'm trying to work with him and he's shoot throwing me as hard as he can and like and specifically spiking me and uh yeah he never I never said anything but Dory Funk ended up pulling him aside and said hey man like fucking lay off on him the, the kid's tough and we've already tested him this is not his first dojo this is his second dojo and he already did a first dojo where we beat the living shit out of him with every single guy basically that was, we beat the shit out of everybody but he was one of the only guys that lasted and that's why he's got the contract and uh, we've, we've already tested him on that level of being tough and there's a difference in being tough and just trying to hurt a guy 
And if you're just trying to hurt a guy that's giving you his body, that's a that's a chicken shit cowardly thing to do. And I think he was a bully. And uh, obviously karma catches people pretty fast because that was right after he got knocked out in the brawl for all and tore his knee and stuff. And I think he was rusty after that. And uh, he threw those weird kind of jabs. And I remember he threw a couple jabs at me and they weren't accurate. He was like, so it was like punches in the face, real punches in the face. And I'm trying to sell, you know, and, and make him look good still because it was our match, but he wasn't, uh, I mean, I say Scott Norton and Steve Williams both. I watched them after, like, uh, was That's, Scott Norton in that game? No, but there's, I just, like, they had that style in Japan that was good, but I don't think that style in WWE would have flown because it was stiff and shoot, like, Vader tried to do it a little bit, and I don't think a lot of guys would put up with that shit in the WWE because they work together on such a, you know, so many shows in a row where if you're hurting guys every single time, you're, and you're punching them and you're getting broken noses or you're, you're chipping a guy's teeth or you're cutting his mouth up and shit, that shit doesn't fly. That's not art. Wrestling's supposed to be the art of throwing a punch that looks great, hits just hard enough to make sense so you can sell it but not hard enough that you're going to have to take the day off the next day because I mean we work the most ridiculous schedule in the world so can I uh, go upstairs for one second yeah, yeah. Edge was in that uh, dojo Christian uh, I guess Edge would have been the most successful ultimately or I guess Kurt Angle was also in that dojo yeah Edge, you know, Edge was already signed he was there he wasn't in the dojo he was in the camp before so Christian was there and Andrew Martin were there, but Edge wasn't there. Kurt Angle's there, the second dojo I was there. I had Kurt Angle's first two matches with him. And another guy that I thought uh, was, I don't know, not, not as, uh, was really nice to me when I was in the dojo and I saw him years later and he was okay, but he seemed like he had other things on his mind and he didn't really want to, didn't want to do the, uh, didn't want to do the go back in time talk and remember what I was trying to talk to him about the dojo and stuff and little things and I guess for him uh, it wasn't a big deal but for me it was because that was all I had so but he was uh, he was a workhorse I talked about his training regiment he got up every morning at like fucking five and did the stairs and ate oatmeal and the protein powder and it's six to ten meals a day or whatever and kind of laughed at me for for not taking the that part of it seriously but in the ring I still think uh, move for move and match for match that I've watched I thought I was a better athlete than Kurt Angle was uh, and a better better wrestler than Kurt Angle ever was too and Kurt can be on TV now and obviously he's a guy that's in WWE so I can't say too much about him because if I ever want to get a job in the future you got all these guys that are in there like they hear, hey I heard Teddy Hart say talk, talk shit about me in a promo or in about a YouTube video or something it's like I never talk shit what I said was I still think move for move and pound for pound and match for match with guys that I got to work and considering the situation and criteria for what I've been through uh, I still think definitely top five wrestlers in the world I put Will Ospreay even though I heard Will Ospreay is a pussy uh, recently that he wouldn't take a match with me and that's disappointing to hear that Will Ospreay who's such a successful uh, talented young guy and I always put him over uh, wouldn't take a match with Teddy Hart and uh, Ricochet is my favorite wrestler in the world uh, him and Jack Evans I think move for move and uh, bump for bump and risk for risk have taken the most risks and done the most moves in wrestling history and uh Kurt Angle is a guy that uh, I thought Brock Lesnar had more balls doing the shooting star press. Uh, I've never seen Kurt do a shooting star press. Maybe he could, but I think Brian Cage, even at his size, did a shooting star once or a 450 and a backflip to the floor. And, um, I mean, like, I've watched, I thought the matches, like Benoit and Jericho and uh, Kurt Angle, I thought Jericho was the best because he lasted the longest and did the coolest shit and was able to go work with young guys and have tremendous matches. Um, and like Kurt Angle was a guy I thought that was fairly bland in there. He did the same kind of stuff all the time and never really saw him uh, come up with a really new move or invent anything and uh, got credited for being better than he was because there wasn't a lot of guys testing the limits at that time of, of, of like indie wrestling now. I see so many guys on indie wrestling that are phenomenal and their shit's solid and their spots are awesome and their combos are great. And then I watch them on TV and I can tell they've got the seatbelt on them. Somebody He's put the taken, you know, the independence out of their uh, style, and it has put the the same old shit, that cookie cutter kind of mold on him. And uh, Kurt was better in the dojo with me, I think, because I was telling him to do all sorts of cool shit, and like watching a guy.
guy like me, you can go out there and then see like if they'd done more shoot stuff. Like as an amateur wrestler, greatest ever, I heard. And as a trainer, hard worker, um, tough guy, probably one of the baddest motherfuckers to ever come into wrestling. But as a wrestler himself, I thought every every match was that same kind of stuff. The like Shelton Benjamin, Charlie Hawes, Kurt Angle uh, had a fairly generic style I thought and they but they got credited for being great wrestlers when uh, maybe they are great wrestlers but I, I didn't really see much more than that same exact match every single week and that's my complaint on some guys and that's why I love Shawn Michaels so much or Rey Mysterio Jr. Uh, or even like a guy like Will Ospreay or Ricochet because I never know what they're going to do and they always come up with new shit and, um, you know Speaking of Rey Mysterio, I don't know if you heard this news today, but uh, he came back at the Royal Rumble yeah. and they posted the video of his comeback and then the video of Ronda Rousey's debut and Ronda Rousey's had something like 1.5 million and Rey Mysterio's had something like 3.5 million, costing far less. Than, than Rousey, so I'm just wondering what you think of that. Ray's a stud, one of my favorite human beings that I met outside the ring that was the same guy outside the ring as he was in the ring. Always super nice, good memory, always took five minutes out of his time to make me feel important when he talked to me, and uh, he always gave me credit for being one of the best guys. He always said you're one of the best guys to do all sorts of really cool shit, and that you guys watched me, obviously, and learned from me and modified it to the next level. Tyson Kidd talked to Ray when I was... Uh, this is 10 years ago and Ray was in there and, and TJ was in at the same time and said that we basically I got motivated to wrestle and uh, stay in wrestling because Ray was so good at that size that he made it believable and he made it possible for guys that I'm not that big and TJ and Harry especially at that age we were all really small and uh, Harry's grown up to be a huge monster and Tyson Kidd looked great when he was in his prime obviously but we still we weren't like 250 pound body guys Harry is but me and Tyson weren't and Jack wasn't but we watched Ray and Ray modeled uh, Ray had a certain style that we modeled our career after and, and moves and, and uh, intensity and uh, execution of this stuff and doing it so clean and being so innovative that and uh, such a unique character that he basically made so many guys in wrestling have a, a path. He, he paved the road for so many young guys that were small to get into wrestling and have a job because he proved he could do it first and get over. And uh, he's one of my favorite guys ever, Ray Mysterio Jr. Ray Mysterio Jr. Shawn Michaels, basically two of the guys that really I modeled my career after trying to be like them and unpredictable and wearing really cool gear and uh, spending a lot of money on the gear and the look and uh, and the moveset and the, the unpredictability of never knowing what they're going to do I think made it cool for fans because fans I'm sure get sick of always watching the same shit and not that I don't do this I do a lot of the same moves all the time but at least I have 15 moves that I do all the time instead of five and uh, like with Brett doing the same four moves and I understood the psychology, that's what you can do when a guy's hurt. You want to do the, your biggest, best moves in a row to him. And like it, it makes sense at the same time. You could also say it's kind of uh, monotonous and, and not lazy. I won't say lazy, but it's, it's uh, to me as a fan, um, I, like to, I like to be kept guessing and I like to be uh, caught off surprise or you know surprise once in a while with what these guys are going to do and not just always know that Kane's going to do this this move this move Undertaker's going to walk the ropes he's never going to do something else besides the double axe handle or every time he goes for the tombstone it's the tombstone or Triple H whenever a guy bends down for a backdrop he gives him that little hit and then it sets up for the pedigree it's like uh, just when guys mix it up a bit I think that's uh, creating creativity and changing their move set or changing the setup on stuff makes it more interesting and again my job is a wrestlers to be interesting and uh, unpredictable and uh, I hope that's something that motto that's followed in the future and I think wrestling but because of Lucha Underground that was another show that really went out there and showed the potential of so many other characters there's so many other good guys that no one really knew of but that all of a sudden now are f household names like Pentagon or Phoenix or uh, uh, AR Fox or the uh, there's another guy Shane Strickland like fucking phenomenal guys that were like definitely world class wrestlers that should have been on WWE TV but since they weren't there they at least got to go to Lucha Underground John Morrison's always been a guy that stepped up and he tried to do more and more cool shit and not just like that same old that same old shit style where it's the same five moves over and over and over again guys like Brian Cage uh, King King Ricochet obviously like these are guys that just they, they go out of their way to be innovative and innovative uh, it's hard to keep going out there and try 
trying to reinvent wrestling and reinvent wrestling moves and to keep changing your style and making it relevant and uh, to keep up with the times and to keep up with all the competition that's out there from young guys. More and more and more new moves and more and more uh, characters and wrestlers that uh, I watch that are phenomenal. And uh, that's the key for wrestling and all the young guys watching these videos to keep going back to the drawing board and keep trying to come up with new ways to set up moves and new moves to do. And obviously there's only so many things you can do with the human body that are possible. But I mean, I still see new moves being done all the time. And uh, I take my hat off to all the innovators of wrestling. And I hope I, can, I at least am remembered as one of the most innovative wrestlers in the world. And uh, that's something people can say about me as I try to be creative and uh, watch figure skating and gymnastics and dancing and uh, anything martial arts, old Bruce Lee movies and uh, Van Damme stuff and see how if I can come up with new, new stuff based on what guys are doing in movies or special effects and uh, gymnastics stuff. And like I say, synchronized swimming and figure skating. And if you watch some of the throws they do and the spins they do and stuff, and it provides you a template for uh, what more, what potentially is still possible in wrestling. Now, why were you ultimately released from that first contract? What was this? Uh, I was just, I was just way too young and stupid. I slept in once, and um, I complained about some, uh, we'll say, like kind of weird activity in the back. Maybe there was like, I thought it was some. Uh, like Victor Quinones was there, and I complained about some some like awkward situations with. Uh, he was known. Uh, well, he had a reputation. I just so. wasn't down for the homosexual. Uh, any type of homosexual activity at all. I'm. Uh, I love women. And I said it in Rolling Stones magazine, I've never got on my knees for a job or for a push. The only thing I've ever got on my knees to do was to, uh, I think I said like pussy and uh, say a prayer to God. And I'll stick to that motto now that I don't know what half these guys ever had to, I don't know what a lot of guys had to do to get jobs or pushes or why that guy got picked and one, one guy didn't and one guy did or why sometimes talent's irrelevant or moves and risks are irrelevant and some guys are considered awesome and uh, I hope they had to. I hope they can look in the mirror and uh, be proud of what they did to get there. And I don't know, and I can't say because I wasn't there. And it's all hearsay. And you can say a lot of shit and go on and go about homosexual activity and different things. And like, I don't know enough about it. It didn't didn't really uh, it didn't really affect me too much. But I was pretty straight up about my views on stuff. And maybe that was something again that I put myself in a situation where. Uh, by saying certain things I alienated other people that were there and like I've heard Pat Patterson stories where Pat's a homosexual and uh, maybe because of my view was I was anti-gay which wasn't even true I like half of my friends are gay and I don't mind a guy that's gay but I don't want to be considered uh, not job worthy because I wasn't wanting to do some homosexual shit and if that's what it took to get a job that wasn't never was put to me like that WWE never came at me with that type of stuff um, so I don't have any specific story or evidence of that happening but I've heard stories and uh, not from me but from legends and different guys and different sources but again half these guys were uh, bitter and talking shit and saying stuff but, I mean I've heard lots of crazy stories about homosexual shit with wrestling but you were talking about a bunch of men running around in tights wrestling sweaty men wrestling and doing moves and grabbing each other obviously it's going to breed a certain type of character but or a certain type of guy but most of the time I've seen is the wrestling is a bunch of young hard-working guys that want to get jobs and that love traveling and playing video games and uh, you know that this is better than a nine to five job and we're lucky to be able to call call ourselves professional wrestlers and we're lucky that the WWE has such an unbelievable uh, factory machine type of thing that they can create uh, shows all over the world and lights and cameras and special effects and social media to have five million, three million, twenty million people watching on pay-per-view and a network that we can go back in time and watch all of our, our fallen heroes and uh, different promotions and matches and, and did in interviews behind the scenes on all these guys' lives and get to know all these guys besides just being wrestlers based on the way Vince McMahon has set up the history of wrestling and bought everybody's DVDs and bought everybody's libraries and um, I don't know like just to me I think I was let go because I was I was smoking pot I was uh, I was disorganized I wasn't I wasn't aware of the opportunity that had been presented I was scared 
Uh, it was too much pressure. I wasn't big enough. Um, no excuses. That was, I say, the second time I was fired was complete bullshit. That was some player hating shit, and that was based on, I think, Brett writing his book and alienating Triple H even more than he already had, and not wanting to go back and do the handshake. And the Tyson kid was sitting at home at a, basically in Florida where he shouldn't have been. He, he worked harder than I did to get the job, and he was there first, and it was supposed to be him and Harry with Natalia and me and Jack. And if anything, it would have been Natalia managing me, Jack, and Harry and TJ all at the same time as the Hart Foundation with Chris Benoit and Jericho supposed to be uh, on our team. So it would have been like Benoit, Jericho, Harry, me, TJ, Natty, and uh, Jack Evans. But the Benoit thing happened when I was in WWE during my second time getting hired, and that, that fucking put the damper on it definitely and then uh, Brett wrote his book and I was released like a week later for some mysterious reason and uh, Tom Pritchard was one of the guys that talked to me and had some reason after of like why I was let go and made no sense to me and then uh, karma caught caught up to him and he got fired basically and then was really bitter about it and was like well, how the fuck do you think I feel I did everything right I never failed any piss tests worst thing I did was Al Snow is the only one to know this and I take my hat off to Al Snow for not being a stooge piece of shit uh, rat a type of guy or one of those agents that's just trying to fuck play like he's your good friend if he's your good friend then you can let a guy slide but one time I slept in in the morning I didn't set up a ring for OVW or something and uh, we had a house show we were doing or whatever and you have to remember I'd set up rings for 10 years for Can-Am wrestling and Stampede Wrestling, and I'd already traveled. I've been wrestling for 10, 11, 12 years by the time I got to WWE the second time, and there was no NXT. There was a fucking meat warehouse with no air conditioning and a bunch of guys that were untrained, basically, uh, that were rookies that they should have had some kind of... Dues hadn't paid their dues and I had to do the same shit they had to do which bothered me a little bit that I'd been wrestling all these years and had been taking uh, bumps and uh, been already getting up and traveling and I uh, paid running my dues companies. and running companies and making millions of dollars and all of a sudden I'm now 500 bucks a week back in Tampa uh, running shit with Steve Kern who didn't really give a shit about my past and treated me like some kind of rookie guy that was new and trying to explain to me how to sell a punch and like teaching me a basically bland wrestling regiment and wanted me to do shoot shooting star presses for a high spot at the dojo every day for five days a week just because that's what you do in the ring well that's what you got to do here this is like every match you have here they'd say this was every match you have here it's like a wrestlemania match you got to put out your full effort and i'm like listen if i wrestle every day my full effort on these little uh whatever dojo matches every day and you're gonna these are like what's gonna determine if i get a job in the future it's like taking a fucking eraser and just grinding it out and using it for nothing and then when you get to the test and you don't have an eraser to erase the answer you put down because you want to change your answer you can't even change your answer because you've worn out the eraser and maybe it's not the best analogy I could have come up with but that's basically something uh, at the time the house shows were having like 30 or 40 you're people talking yeah nothing and it, and it was it was a joke you had to be up at 7 8 in the morning every day five days a week you weren't getting paid any extra money plus you paid your own rent and there was no NXT as I say there was no uh, developmental school there wasn't even a shower in the building there was one small bathroom and like FCW. A, it was terrible. Building. Yeah, it was. It wasn't. It wasn't good, and it wasn't organized, and it was. Uh, it wasn't a professional operation that WWE had normally had a reputation of running. It wasn't like the dojo with Dory Funk, and it wasn't like Bret Hart's wrestling school where you know it was at, at one o'clock in the afternoon. You got to have breakfast and lunch, and then show up there and wrestle with Leo Burke, who was an unbelievable trainer. You got Tom Pritchard, who was okay, uh, running a fairly simple program for a bunch of guys that had really no experience at all, and you're wrestling guys that are green and they don't know how to bump and you and you're trusting them with your body and uh and having to set up the ring every day take down the ring set up the ring and take down the ring set up the ring and like that to me it's i'm not above doing that i did it but i came from that family that well, don't forget who i am and why i don't see i don't think shane mcmahon's having to set up a ring and i don't think triple h was having to set up too many rings and i don't think Shawn michaels had to set up too many rings i don't think brett had to set up too many rings i mean this is after 10 years of wrestling after it wasn't like i was just some rookie and i don't mind uh doing whatever everyone else has to do but at the same time 
time. It wasn't what I thought for WWE. You're supposed to be at a dojo. It's like imagine playing Major League Baseball and you're on the farm team and it's like you're taking uh, a broken down bus to the game and like your equipment doesn't work and there's there's fucking an umpire and he's fucked he's he's fucked up and he's calling a ball a strike and a foul ball a home run and shit and it just didn't seem to make sense. Right, because and the then, referees were yeah. trainees too. Right? And right after that, everyone gets to go to NXT. Right after I left, all of a sudden they got a new building, they got new rings. There's no more setting up. The ring. guys don't have to do no. the, uh, the school it. now, right? No. Or very few classes. And it was, so, I mean, it's just like, I just was there wrong place, wrong time, it seems. Or maybe I was one of the guys that they did that to on purpose just because it makes it that much harder for Teddy Hart to be. And I always think that would be a weird reason for not having me. And I thought I would be one of the most successful guys at The Rock did what he did and was considered charismatic and uh, a movie star and a great look. And, uh, you know, Stone Cold got into movies and he did this. And, you know, John Cena got into this or Ted DiBiase Jr could even make a movie let alone a couple or Randy Orton's doing a movie that like Teddy Hart had the same uh, potential then and never with my potential was never watered it was always pissed on I thought and because of Brett and the stigma of the hearts and uh, my my attitude they had of me being crazy because I wore a flashy outfit to a show or I wore the same outfits on the street as I wore in the ring so people could recognize me that type of stuff was the considered so bad I was so such a loose cannon or risk to work with when I, I I think all that shit basically was copied later by guys like Morrison or CM Punk cutting shoot type of promos in the ring and I'd cut a shoot promo before the match about stuff like you know and, and I thought a lot of things I did were copied later and made into successes because they allowed that guy to do it but they didn't allow me to do it and it was I won't say it's unfair but I hope in the future maybe there's still that small chance that WWE is going to go what's the worst thing the guys said about us there was some homosexual activity in WWE, no, I never said that. What I said was, uh, for me being let go at 18, I voiced my opinion about Victor Quinones being kind of weird, just him specifically. But I said it in a way that maybe made me sound like I hated, uh, I was anti, anti gay. Or I had said well, Gary something. Gary Grell told us in our shoot interview he yeah. grabbed him at one point. So there's so. another source of like my my thing was I complained about Victor Quinones during my dojo when I was there and that was brought back to WWE and they thought I I had talked uh, inappropriately about that or something and then I was also I had used GHB when I was there and it was legal again in the store I could buy it and Kurt Angle was also uh, a guy that had bought bottles and Andrew Martin bought bottles and Steve Regal had bought bottles all of us it was told to it was helping us sleep and it was used to help us sleep so there's a way it was a, it was it was or, yeah and it was for releasing growth hormone and it was something again if i'm buying it at gnc and it's legal you know at that time i thought it was something that i was taking to help me out obviously it was getting me fucked up and everyone in wrestling half the guys can't say they don't like getting fucked up look in the mirror half you guys fucking we all want to have a beer or have a buzz or smoke a joint or you know what i mean like fuck, that's takes takes them takes the edge off right that's the whole point that's why half the world's doing drugs there's we're, not much we're the only adrenaline guy. junkies exactly and it's hard to sleep after fucking going to a show and having 30,000 people cheering your name and all of a sudden you got to go to sleep and catch a plane at six in the morning so that that's ghb was something i used that i thought helped me out and it was another thing that was used against me because i probably didn't do it at the right time or place i take responsibility for all these things it's just your reasons are this was this is what happened i can make a story up and say something and you know it wouldn't be accurate and i think you watch these interviews for like the last 15 years or 10 years that I've done them and it's always been the same shit and sometimes I get into more detail on things than you know than, than I needed to potentially but again I think that's what makes fans that likes Teddy Hart shoot interviews or that watch me go hey that guy tells a real story and he might talk too much about certain things but I could either give you like the Carlito my Devin said Carlito we did a shoot video with him and he answered everything in 20 minutes I might one of my answers might take 20 minutes just to talk about it and I hope that again uh, I got a guy named Sean who watches Teddy Hart shoot videos he says he sometimes puts him on and he goes to sleep because he knows after watching like he's watching he's, he knows it'll be something he can watch for the next three hours so he'll watch to a certain point and he'll fall asleep with the video on but he watches that video like nine different days because it takes that long to watch the whole video but it provides him something to do after work and I thought that was kind of cool and like I say shout out to Sean because Sean was one of the guys that told me 
how much fun uh, I am to watch on TV and he loves my interviews and I've had a lot of fans tell me that they don't even watch my matches most of them they watch my shoot interviews and the shoot interviews are what made them like me or understand me or appreciate me because I tell the truth and they could tell that I take passion and uh, I love my I love wrestling and I love making people happy and I love signing autographs after shows and sitting out with the fans and having a beer and being one of the boys uh, that's not one of the boys in the back trying to talk to Sammy Callahan about getting a job in the future I'm trying to talk to 20 fans about uh, you know buying a kitten or fucking going out to meet some strippers or have a good time and you know that's that's to me I'm a human being I love wrestling fans more than you can imagine that's why I risk my life for wrestling fans to smile and clap and I never got paid any extra to do cool moves or risk my life or and I always thought it would be shitty if you went to a job and at your job you mailed it in you get fired and in wrestling it seems like you get rewarded for mailing it in and that's what makes you famous is a guy that did the same three moves every time and a guy like me who does 25 moves is told that I was too much of a risk to deal with or it wasn't worth investing money on and my future now is on independent wrestling I'll never be on TV I'll never make the Hall of Fame and I won't be in a video game and those are things that are hard to swallow but I, I still think the reward that Teddy Hart has as an exchange is that when I walk the streets as a wrestler people see me and the wrestling fans at Wrestlemania when I go there shook my hand and said they loved watching me because I risked my life for their entertainment and I risked my life on these promos telling the truth and maybe that could be something Tyson Kidd and Natalia can use as a as a, a as a positive thing someday to put me on TV and be like this is the most honest guy in wrestling and this is the guy that's done probably almost move for move the most uh, moves in wrestling history off the highest different jumps and different times and uh, has been consistent for 20 years of delivering great matches you can watch almost any Teddy Hart match on YouTube and I say to the fans out there do your homework and watch me before you say something about me and if after that you got an opinion at least it's validated because you watch you watch the man do it instead of just saying something you read on the internet or you went to Wikipedia and read some bullshit that Wikipedia wrote. I don't have time to defend myself half the time. Uh, back in the Ring of Honor days and stuff where like they would talk all this shit and say all these things about me. Half the time those are angles I made with fans. Not with fans but with the booker to create fan uh, interest so fans would wonder if this was a shoot or if this guy was really crazy and it's like if I'm really crazy obviously I'm not going to be able to do half these moves because a guy who's retarded or crazy he, his body's not going to work in that type of way and he's going to hurt, hurt guys and if I've never hurt anybody obviously I was a master at what I was doing and masters generally aren't retarded or crazy they're pretty concise smart and uh, accurate and that's the reason I say to people don't get confused with the hype and go behind the scenes and watch the vet, watch the man himself and listen to what I say on my videos and why I love you and why I do it and it was to make you smile and to make you get up and go hey uh, this guy worked his ass off because he respected fucking the nine to five guy that worked his ass off to come up with five bucks ten bucks a hundred bucks to support the great sport of wrestling you're the ones that keep us going right? it's your money and your time and your love for us otherwise we'd be wrestling in a fucking empty building and I've done that before and it's not very fun now uh, you mentioned Chris Benoit uh, played a role in helping get you hired yeah. what was your relationship like with him I came to my house a couple times and uh, just on his off day I hadn't seen him in years since I was a kid and he said that he was interested in trying to get me in WWE he wanted to know why I wasn't there and then he uh, took me and Jack Evans and Harry Smith down to the gym we all wrestled for him for like four hours he was in the ring doing everything with us and out of Chris's mouth he thought that Jack and I were two of the best guys ever he said that he'd never seen guys do as much stuff as me and Jack and as technical as I could be and I still don't show a lot of my technical game because it just gets copied and I always hoped that was something I could save for WWE was to, to be like that Zack Sabre Jr. technical style but to represent a body that was like a Chris Benoit body or Kurt Angle body where you're in great shape physically but you have a, a really cool move set and a, a very simple if they want me to wrestle simple like Brett simple where I can be like Brett but still so technical and uh, innovative that people haven't seen a lot of that stuff before so I I don't know it was just uh, Benoit was so intense and uh, his son's really cool I met his son his son's supposed to start wrestling now but Benoit was so intense in the ring but such a gentleman outside the ring Jericho is like the progression of Benoit to me like he kept the heart name alive even though Jericho and we know this between us is like he gives the hearts a lot more credit than they deserve for what he did and it's nice of him because he was from that area or from Calgary and he makes us sound like we were the successful trainers but Jericho did that on his own fucking hard work and innovation Jericho was always so nice to me and Benoit was always so nice to me so those are guys that just for whatever class acts outside the ring Jericho is the only guy to ever get me a booking and get me uh, on uh, that uh, I forget what the show is called uh, Velocity 
and got me paid up front and took me to the, the bar and bought me drinks and was nice to me as a human being and every time I've ever seen him did the podcast let me just go on a tear didn't try talking a bunch of shit or bringing up a lot of stupid questions and just like uh, every time I ever called him on the phone he answered the phone and had time for me no matter how busy he was and I heard the same thing for David Benoit that David Benoit Chris Benoit's son that Jericho's taken him under his wing and helped him out and talked to him and uh just as as two of my favorite guys in wrestling that were nice to me outside the ring and helped me feel important and didn't make me stand at the fucking door like a mark with my bag in my hand like some piece of shit desperate to get a job because I never asked for a job in WWE and I've never sent a video in once and I always said the same thing I've been trying to shy away you haven't seen too many times where I'm hovering in the back trying to get Tyson Kidd to introduce me to Vince or trying to get a to get free tickets so I can go hang out and meet some of the guys that I used to train with in the back and uh, hey can you get me in now and you get me a job or go show up at NXT with my bag and maybe try to manipulate some situation where I can get get them to look at me. If you don't know who I am or where I'm at and I gotta send you a bunch of videos and beg for a job, it's probably not gonna happen. And I hope I hope that's a that's considered a compliment to you guys that I've worked so hard and made myself internationally famous and independently renowned as a guy that's unpredictable and having great matches, but unpredictable is not unpredictable. It's the unpredictability of wondering what move I'm gonna do next. Not that I'm gonna show up. So I've been trying to be reliable enough to show up now and uh, be a certain guy that's taken all these bookings after going to jail and going through fucking rehab even though I didn't need to be in rehab I volunteered for it twice just to prove to WWE that I was clean that I, I had no problems you could trust me in your facility and then uh, to go to jail and to beat the charges back to back to back three times I've been in court fighting for my life for 15 years 20 year fucking verdicts that I beat 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 got probation and you know uh, the reason I say what I'm saying now is because I wanted to make Benoit proud that he vouched for me or I want to make Jericho proud or give them something they could chew on to say so if Benoit was alive he could have said hey this 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 and this because he was the guy that told the truth and same with Jericho in the future if Jericho can help or help me get a job or he could say something he could say hey man I've watched Teddy Hart go through some terrible shit and the guy's had his up and downs and obviously no nobody's perfect but I've tried to make I've tried to make amends on it and I've tried to make amends of showing up on time to shows in the last two years and not missing any bookings and having great matches with strange guys and putting guys over and uh that's so guys like Tyson Kidd and Natalia and uh, anyone that ever says my name can say my name with uh, with a smile and say that they're proud of me and they trust me and that Vince or whoever is in the company in the future, Triple H or whoever, or Stephanie McMahon or Shane McMahon, another guy that's always been really cool to me, Shane McMahon, can uh, go, let's take a chance on Teddy Hart like we did AJ Styles. Uh, let's take a chance on uh, Teddy Hart like we did Samoa Joe or, you know, and Neville's a guy that was so good that they pushed to the moon and didn't want to be there and now he's, he's not even working even though he's under contract I think he's just decided that he didn't want to work anymore because he didn't like the direction that his character was going in and like I wish he would have given me Neville's spot and uh, let me have a, the ball to run with or let me do some of those moves that he got to do because I'm mean, sure uh, he knows how hard they are to do every week there's only a couple of us in the world that can do those moves every week consistently without getting hurt and he was one of them and uh, it was sad to see that happen to him he was one of the guys I love Neville is one of my favorite wrestlers in the world same with Ricochet and now Ricochet is in the WWE and I hope he doesn't have the same thing happen to him where he gets frustrated and he feels watered down and then ends up being uh, mad because he was doing more stuff on indies and more successful on the indies than he was in WWE so well apparently Jericho is the one that recommended to the people that own impact now to put Scott Demore and Don Callis in charge of the company they're one of the three so uh, nice. you may want to talk to him about that because they are losing uh, all their talent now due to cutbacks and so forth. And really? Putting on more events in Canada. They're owned by a Canadian Yeah, company, I heard that. So. Ed Norsky or something like that? Ed Nordholm or something. Nordholm, yeah. yeah, you might want to talk to Jericho about that. Um, I talked to Ed actually like once. He actually invited me to TNA in Florida during the time I was under... Uh, I, I was actually running from the law at that time. Nobody knew, so I didn't want to push my luck too much with trying to ask for a job and show up on TV if I ever got that lucky with TNA and then have the the uh, US Marshals show up and take me out of the building because I would have really fucked it up so I'm hoping TNA I would like to work with TNA I got a show coming up with them uh, I guess it's not a show it's like a joint show with Rev Revolution Pro I don't think you'll have this part on the video before
before the show because it's supposed to be a surprise but we obviously I think yeah, this will be released will be after up. so you guys can hear it now that I'm just but I'm excited about that opportunity I, I would like to be in TNA I've, I've avoided TNA before I had an offer from them when Jeff Jarrett was running it and I was wrestling there with Jack for Team Canada and Scott Demore tried to get me in and uh, I avoided it I didn't think it was was it Scott that brought you yeah. into TNA that first time? I used the analogy of I think I thought I could have made the NFL so I didn't want to settle for the CFL if I thought I could make the NFL which is WWE's NFL and TNA's CFL but at the end of the day I would have rather just played either way I would have played in any league instead of being cut out completely so now everyone knows the it's a famous altercation yeah with CM Punk there could you tell us like what the whole story was that caused that fight CM Punk uh he, he had he had big balls. He wanted he wanted to be the guy that stepped up and that tested Teddy Hart, and uh, he he was agreeable to go outside and handle it, and uh, we handled it outside. And uh, the only reason I say anything about it was because he lied about it at first and said that he got the best of me and that he beat me and different things. And I if it's like one of those fights, it's kind of like a, a draw and no one really knows who wins but if there's a one-sided fight where one guy's on his ass knocked down and he's you getting pulled off pulled basically. off of him because i was kicking the shit out of him then obviously you're gonna go tell people you won the fight after when you're supposed to be a guy that's all about the truth i was disappointed in that part of cm punk's uh we'll say uh memory or his depiction of what happened because he was lying through his fucking teeth and uh I that was the one thing that put up a red flag when he said he was going to go into ufc because he wasn't like a tournament fight or anything like that and the only fight i had heard of him ever being in was the fight with you that's a legitimate fight yeah and i would think i'm a pretty legitimate tough guy uh and never got golden gloves yeah and, and i fought lots on the street and like i say i survived in jail and I've, I've walked around with a big mouth for for a lot of years and i still have all my teeth in my mouth so and uh I lived in a city where Calgary's pretty renowned for bar fights and like a lot of cowboys and drunks and fucking, you know, it's like we're... And I've seen it firsthand, you've never backed down from a fight. Ever. Whether it's a group of bouncers. Yeah, I mean, I have big balls. Or a guy I mean. on rollerblades standing on a... You know me, so you, you see me in some fucked up situations because you know me on the street. I mean, I, I, w I wouldn't say I'm the toughest guy in the world, but you're going to be, uh, I think almost any guy... If at, if at 200 pounds, I'm 200 pounds and in good shape, you're going to know I was there, definitely. You're not just going to walk through me. I don't care what size you are. You could be 6'10 or fucking, you know, two, 300 pounds. Uh, I always think a small pit bull with, uh, if I bench three plates and my hand strength's pretty awesome and I bench 150 pound dumbbells and doesn't matter at that size, once you're that size, if you're over 200 pounds or 190 to 200 pounds, that's a pretty serious weight class to be in and, and you could fight anybody any place anywhere anytime and uh, i pride myself on uh, never backing down from a challenge on any man on the planet but i don't want to be fighting every guy either I'd, I'd rather be a lover i put this up for a reason peace and love and try to talk about uh, good things in wrestling and if i knock kurt angle i also said kurt angle was the hardest working guy i've ever seen when he was training and if i knocked fucking aj styles or i didn't in this interview but i have i also say he's one of the greatest wrestlers ever and he's lasted so long and he's always done cool shit and he's always been one of the hardest working guys ever and if I ever said something bad about Steve Regal then I also go back to that Steve Regal is such a nice guy to me we ate dinner together he paid for everything and he took me out and uh, treated me like a brother and a young or like a son and I don't know him in the future and maybe that's his job is because he's turned his life around because he got clean and he got straight because he followed the WWE regiment that maybe I tried to follow in your footsteps I went to rehab I tried to get off the marijuana I never took GHB for the last five years I never touched it again because it was something that people used against me because it wasn't something that you could take with you on the road and it was illegal on top of that and you don't want a guy taking chances with illegal drugs wrestling for your company but I mean do I think guys in WWE are all perfect lily white clean and no one's ever touched anything or does anything no, obviously not true but I'm not there to be the detective or to expose shit or to try to be a tattletale and this guy got high with me and we did this drug together and we fucked we went to the strip club together we went to the Asian massage parlor it's like a lot of shit I've done guys and you guys know who you are and what you did and what we've done together I don't mention on these interviews which if you really think about me and my big mouth I'm pretty select with what I say but at the same time you still got to say something you can't just completely kayfabe everybody out there that's why these interviews are supposedly no kayfabe and it's supposed to be the truth so there's certain shit I say just out of respect that I I don't tell uh, both girls I fucked in wrestling 
You never hear me talk about divas that I've done anything with, and maybe I've done tons of shit. Maybe I haven't. You never hear me talk about really much more than my wife or girlfriend who said they were escorts and what I did and ran an escort agency because it happened and I made a lot of money in a business that was legal. I mean, I grew a lot of marijuana. You want to see videos of it? You want to know that I have it. I have proved that Rolling Stones magazine just didn't put me in there because it was a, a funny story. I've sold 200 cats. That means that to clean up cat shit every day and cut their fur and take care of them and keep them healthy and cut on bill cords and watch a bunch of kittens die and deal with that type of stress I had my house burned to the ground I've had my fucking life basically thrown in uh, a terrible public public depiction of being a sexual rapist or sexual assault when there's all these pieces of shit out there like Harvey Weinstein and all these guys that are actually doing it and like I never did shit to girls besides fucking be nice to them buy them flowers never hit a woman in my life Machigo can say whatever she wants on it if a girl kicks me in the face or hits me or says something uh, about me being a faggot uh, I'm going to be pretty upset about that type of uh, comments or something and I'll defend myself accordingly to that but uh, I go out of my way to say to most people that you can trust me with your family you can trust me with your kids you can trust me with your your money and I'll always be a guy that uh, is concise and pays you back or uh, takes care of you or protects you or drives you home if you were fucked up and uh, as a brother and best friend if you're one of Teddy Hart's brothers or best friends I think I'm one of the best guys you can ever meet. Now, you worked with uh, Vampiro, I guess, in AAA and Wrestling Society X. Just wondering what your thoughts are on him. Another guy I heard lots of bad shit about, but in my opinion, he was always nice to me. Vampiro was really cool to me, and he always put me and Jack over as two of the best wrestlers ever. That he, he thought we were the most innovative and the, ahead of our time, and that people would be copying the moves we did for the next 10 years, 20 years, and doing a cheap copy of it, and they would never do it as well as us. And so, I mean, I've heard, I've heard a lot of stories about Vampiro being. Uh, Talking behind people. Yeah, but I mean, that, that, I heard that. But same thing, I heard that about Conan, too. But I mean, Conan's probably uh, way. Conan's way more respected because of all the stuff he's done for the boys. But at the same time, like, Vampiro, for, for what he did in Mexico. Um, he fucking was very famous, man. He made a lot of people respected him in Mexico. Fans really liked him, and I never knew how popular he was until I went there and I walked in his shoes. And uh, every time I ever asked him for a ride, he gave me one. Anytime I ever needed any help, he gave it to me. Um, so in Rusty Society X, he was the one that pushed me to win every one of those matches and to basically do all those moves. He said, I want Teddy Hart to do all this shit. I want him to be the guy that's carrying the torch for Rusty Society X. And so I, 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 my, my hope is to get in Lucha Underground, and I hear Vampiro's the guy that's doing the Lucha Underground stuff, but I've been going through Paul London and trying to get, hopefully, Paul London, who's another fucking fascinating guy, genius, I think uh, underrated, and uh, just super cool guy outside the ring that needs to get way more credit and worked super hard in WWE. It was such a hard work that I didn't get the right respect that he deserved and uh, he's trying to get me in Lucha Underground I hope it, with some of his connections and networking that maybe I get a job and I could work for Lucha Underground it was a dream job I always wanted to work for them but with the charges I had the last three and a half years I could never get an opportunity to go there without dealing with legal shit and they didn't want to deal with that type of headache so you always hear how crazy Mexico is and how dangerous it is what was your experience there? not dangerous at all I thought it was maybe dangerous if you're if you're an asshole if you don't understand how nice Mexican people are and how much they love the business and you're blowing fans off that want to get a picture or an autograph, then maybe it could be dangerous because you just basically uh, signed your own death warrant. You got some guy who works a fucking 10 hour, 12 hour, 14 hour day for like 10 bucks and he spends 10 bucks on a Polaroid and you're blowing away, you're blowing him off like it didn't mean shit or he buys your mask for $100 and that's what he made in the whole week. He didn't make that in a day. He made that in a week of working and you act like he doesn't mean shit. Then that's... Uh, that's a recipe for disaster. For me, it was it was very uh, very relaxing and fun and educational. And the, the Mexican wrestling fans, I put them over as the best wrestling fans in the world. Like Japanese fans, I heard are pretty good, but they're not as vocal. And uh, I think Mexican fans make the least amount of money to spend the most amount of money and time. Time's obviously the one thing I always talk about is the most important thing is your time. And if you spend time watching me or you spend time studying me, I, I think Mexico is a place that allowed Teddy Hart to become a big superstar. And I am a big. I think I am. 
am a big superstar in Mexico. I probably should go back there and do more stuff there, but uh, trying to do indie wrestling in the States to try to get potentially a job in WWE is I wanted to be in a place where they could see, they could hear and see me more. And the stories of Teddy Hart are being carried now that I'm a different person, more mature, smarter, uh, you know, uh, more professional and someone that can be trusted or relied on by all these different promoters. I got 55 bookings in two and a half months since I got out. Of, I've been out of jail for less than two months and in less than a month and a half, I picked up 55 bookings. So I'm pretty proud that there's that many promotions and that many guys that believe Teddy Hart could be a, a guy that's worth bringing in and, and will make the promotion better. And fans that everywhere I go, the fans that see me seem to be grateful and very smart and they've watched a lot of these shoot videos. So I'm always like, I'm proud that these videos get out there and that people have time to watch them and thank you for making me famous again guys because it's your time and energy and love and appreciation and then you're telling other people about me that makes me a legend and lets me live forever and at one point you had some heat with Steve Carino I think you guys it's, o it's over now but now he has a position in WWE yeah, yeah. Same thing, Steve was a guy that I thought was a really good guy, a uh, nice guy in the dojo when I met him, and maybe I was uh, like a wild card and uh, arrogant kid at that time, and I didn't know the opportunity that I had, or I wasted my, my opportunity, and that was something he said, but he called me a goof in an interview uh, that he did, and that, that word means something in Canada, maybe different than it does in the States, but it's, uh, it's a really bad thing to call somebody, and I challenged... Uh, Steve to go outside and talk to me and if you're gonna say that in an interview say it to my face and uh, he didn't didn't want to go outside and talk to me and I think he was uh, probably you know just talking like that at the time because he didn't uh, he didn't realize what it meant and he wasn't trying to say that I was I mean like it's, it's just it's like wording I was in a clubhouse when it was said and there was a bunch of bikers and the word goof means like child molester fucking pedophile type faggot like it's a bad bad where I think he meant I was a goofy kid more of like that I was silly and stupid I didn't know what I was doing and that so when I talked to him in person I think uh his understanding of what that meant and my understanding of what that meant were two different things so I kind of let him off the hook and I hoped that he was going to be a guy that down the road we worked together we did a show together and I put him over in a match we did a fucking screwy finish and made it look like it was a shoot and we never hurt each other he was professional with me as professional with him and then he might not like me outside the ring but once we get in the ring we got a job to do and that's take care of each other and that's the number one rule and he followed that rule so my respect for Steve Carino was high I guess his son's a big fan of mine. I heard his son's a big fan of mine. I heard his son's a pretty cool kid, and I know guys that are training with him. So I, I hope Steve uh, takes care of his son and gets his son into a position to, to carry on the last name, the Carino last name, and that Steve uh, in the WWE is fair, and he's uh, helpful and does his job and gets guys experience. He's got a lot of experience and a lot of good ideas. And... Um, I think as a wrestler, he was pretty good for what he was. He was, I think he was better than I gave him credit for before, so I'll take my hat off to Steve Carino now and say, like, I've heard a lot more things from Steve Carino that were positive, and whenever I met him in the future, he was always nice to me, he took took lots of time out to talk to me, and never tried, never superstarred me. Same with CM Punk, the few times I saw CM Punk on the street, he never superstarred me, he was nice to me, and talked to me, and took me out, and got me in the back, and like, so my hat's off to them, even though I was mad at them at the time, in the future, when I saw them again, they were always really cool, like Batista was super, super nice to me, always really cool, always never superstarred me, Jericho never superstarred me, like where some guy like Keith Lee, I see him, and like, I talk to him, and he seemed to have like, some kind of attitude, like he was almost too busy to talk to me, or he didn't want to say hi, or he was walking around with a title like a title from Gabe Sabalski's show of like I forget what promotion it was maybe it was uh, what's the evolve is that what it's called evolve title around his waist walking around like his shit didn't stink and I was like man I said like, if some of the guys I met in wrestling Kevin Nash and Batista and Hogan and like fucking Jericho or all have five minutes to talk and they're all really cool like Shawn Michaels but Keith Lee a guy that's like a kind of a, a big deal for indie wrestling this year last year his name kind of popped on the scenes is looking like he's too busy to talk to me I said respect your fucking elders and your vets man I've been around a long time and Steve Carino was a guy that was always I guess uh, whenever I needed to talk to him was there and he always was nice to me so I can't really say anything bad about him now did you ever work Kevin Owens on the indie scene yeah I worked Kevin Owens and uh, Jersey All Pro 
Are you surprised with his look, the uh, push he ultimately got? Yeah, I was. I was pretty surprised. I, I thought, same with him and Samoa Joe, I just thought both those guys could have probably gone to the gym a bit more and uh, maybe it would have enhanced their character. But, I mean, if that's what it is and that's, that's the character that's supposed to be the, the, the kind of the guy that's a little thicker or, or fat guy that's going to be... I guess sympathized with or respected by all the other fat guys that are out there then I guess that's totally understandable that you need a character like that but I mean Yokozuna was Yokozuna and he was a sumo wrestler these guys aren't 400 500 pound sumo wrestlers they're supposed to be athletes and I don't think you can walk into MMA and uh, I don't see too many guys in UFC that are fat or out of shape that look like and are getting pushed like they're killers maybe back in the day but like Bono from Pride yeah like maybe I mean like I understand like I'm not I just thought if I was that guy in that opportunity what would a Kevin Owens be that was in the gym every day that lost 30 pounds and got jacked a little bit and got got a really good look would he be even more valuable maybe and that's all I'm trying to say is I just want to see a character enhanced so like I would have loved to see Samoa Joe go to the gym more and get in better shape like Brock Lesnar if he just showed up kind of fat and and out of shape out of nowhere I don't think his look would be as respected or Ron Strowman all of a sudden just comes out with a big gut and he's like fucking he's fat all of a sudden I was like I don't think that would be cool like or if like you know what I mean like that's that's all I'm trying to say Cena came out out of nowhere and all of a sudden Cena was like beer belly and he's got a beard and like fucking he doesn't seem to care about his looks like a Wendy's yeah like it's like that was that was my knock on Christian and CM Punk and Edge was they all kind of didn't go to the gym much after it looked like and like stopped training hard where I saw Jericho Jack for years Benoit was jacked for years, maybe at the end of their career, 45, 46, 47, fine. Jericho comes in, he's not completely jacked, but the match he had with Kenny Omega was better than any match he had in the last basically 10 years, I think. So, I mean, he maybe sacrificed a little time in the gym, but at the same time, he's doing music, he's doing fucking podcasts, he's traveling, he's pushing guys, he's helping out with all these different projects, and then goes in and delivers a performance that's just unbelievable. But I'm just saying, could I, if the knock was, what's his look? The look to me was uh, different, and I don't know if they, it could be enhanced. And that was my complaint: was I just wish some of these guys maybe could enhance their look just to try a different style. And maybe if it doesn't, if it's not successful, and you don't feel healthier, then obviously maybe and I'm talking shit. But I think that most guys that are a little overweight, if they got in better shape, they'd be more entertaining to watch. That's just personal opinion. Like a car with a flat tire might run better. Just as a representative yeah. of the industry that exactly. we're all in, exactly. We're trying to. See stick up for it when we tell people that we're professional wrestlers it'd be nice if we had he's not the champion anymore maybe that has something to do with it but someone that looks exactly like an athlete and one of the funniest things i ever heard not funny but strange i heard him on uh, steve austin's podcast saying what he does on the road is when he's not wrestling he tries to sleep as much as possible to make the time go by faster because he doesn't necessarily like being on the road but it's like you can't spend an hour in the gym lifting some weights or something yeah that's funny i never heard i i, I tried I, I need to watch more podcasts and do some more homework on some stuff because i guess that's part of being a wrestler now for me is to do to do that part of the business but i i just just getting fresh out of jail and like just getting back on my feet and getting into the swing of things it's uh it's a lot of pressure just to survive and find a place to stay in Philly and make sure that my house is clean and that I have a cool place to stay and that I that I have my cat and uh, it's protected and fed and taken care of and that my gear, I got new gear coming and I went back to Canada finally after two years of not being back home and getting some of my outfits and going back to the seamstress and the sewers and going back to Bucio in Mexico and trying to enhance my look. So like I say, in six months from now, uh, people can go, man, Teddy Hart looks like a pro bodybuilder again. He's a he's shredded he's in great shape but right now I'm not in the best shape and I said that because it's it's really hard for me to get up uh, to get the money the motivation and the time to get to a gym without a car I haven't I've lost my vehicle so I'm getting a vehicle now I I'm just getting familiar with uber or bank account I've never had these things I always have managers and I live in Canada so getting a dual citizenship a passport getting to the states and setting up a bank account in the states getting a cell phone in the states getting set up to be in another country and to go from city to city to city I've 
been in from Texas to Dallas, from, sorry, from from Dallas to uh, to Tampa to Orlando to back to Dallas to Philly now, and uh, seven and a half months of my life was locked up during that time, and two months of that time was in rehab. So that's nine months out of a year and a half that I was basically locked up and dealing with the rules and limitations on what I could do, and I still took. I think 40, 40 matches, 40 bookings, and I think every match I had on those shows was were all uh, at least four star matches. And maybe Meltzer can't give me a five star match, but I, I think if uh, Kenny Omega, who's unbelievable, and I'm giving him huge credit, I just ask if Kenny Omega is doing that good in Japan. I think Teddy Hart could do pretty fucking good in Japan too, given the same opportunity. So, what did you do to keep yourself sane when you were in jail? Uh, man, I read books for the first time in my life. I'm not a very good reader. I used to make jokes that I was illiterate, and obviously I'm not quite illiterate, but I was not the best reader. But I, my reading skills got a lot better in jail. I read uh, like seven or eight books the past time. And uh, I used to try to talk to guys about their life story and what, what happened to them and listen and uh, just be nice to everybody in jail. I think I was a very friendly guy in jail. And a lot of guys that know me, like I bet Teddy Hart was successful in jail and he was a good guy guy good listener and nice guy and always generous I always had money in my canteen so I always made everybody eat together and we do spreads and we make a lot of different meals like you always hear about the jail food is the shits but the commissary in jail is pretty cool it's not the healthiest but like we made all sorts of stuff like we made cake and uh, they would like take all the Oreo cookies you get Oreo cookies or like different cookies when you order a canteen and you take the cookies and you take all the icing out of them and you put the icing in one bowl and then you take the cookie the, the crumbs and then you get that wet you grind it all up you make that into a dough and you make like one layer of cookie dough basically and that's the cake and then on top of that you take like Werther's Originals and you crack them up and you take like ice cream you can get from commissary from premium and you add the ice cream you take the Reese's pieces and you melt them down in, hot, in the hot water and you melt them and you make that another layer and like different things like uh, the gummy bears and like sour worms and like you add all that to a cake and all of a sudden these guys are selling slices of the cake and that's the way they make their money and I would always chip in on the cakes and my mom was a chef so I always like to see how the innovation at jail how these guys made shit work like same thing with like pizza they'd, they'd be like soup and they take the broth out and it's itchy van soup the, you know the, the ramen soup and then they add like the nacho cheese to that or Doritos to that or the fin they add tuna fish or salmon or whatever like the and that type of shit was always it amazed me how good the snacks were in jail that's what kept me going a lot of times was to, to watch these different races like a black the black guys have their meal the Spanish guys have theirs the white guys have theirs but yet with me in there we all ate together and I had to make everyone spread together and pray together and I always thought I was uh, I was making people uh, understand that I'm supposed to be a tough guy wrestler who's walking around in there and famous and the guards knew me and instead of having an attitude like a superstar I was the guy that was making sure everybody else was a superstar because I wanted these guys to feel important and he made people that are uh, in a dark dirty filthy fucking shit will jail feel important and um, you'd be surprised their prayer I always ask them to give me a prayer and a blessing and for whatever reasons I beat this last charge I was facing 10 years in jail and I asked all the guys to pray for me and before I left there was like about 20 guys in the cell all my cells both sides back and forth all all saying a prayer before I left that I got out they didn't think I deserved to be in there they thought I was such a nice guy that uh, that I needed to get back onto my my accomplishing my goal as a wrestler and live my dream and get back to Mexico or maybe get to Japan or my my big goal obviously dream and I don't I don't look at it as a reality really anymore it would be a, a guess, final run in WWE I hope that would happen I say this now and I hope the guys aren't going ah fuck we know what he wants so fuck him we'll keep him out more like feel sympathy for me a little bit of that I've wasted uh, 18 years of my career trying to chase that dream and it's never happened to me I'd like to get a doll made I'd like to be in the Hall of Fame I'd like the pay-per-view where I'm you know in that pay-per-view or wrestling the top guy and if it doesn't happen you know what I found other ways of making my career relevant and happy and looking in the mirror and still uh, finding finding as Shawn Michaels said finding my smile I think I, I still find a way to smile and go to the gym at night and if I'm working out at 3 in the morning half the time it's like me getting a ride from some strange guy at a bar or some guy I met at the gym or right before they go to work they'll drop me off at the gym and then I gotta meet a guy at the gym to get a ride back so I mean it's like uh, 
I'm still finding innovative ways to survive in a Philadelphia in a city where I don't really know anybody and to, to come up with a, a really nice house that I live in and have awesome roommates and be able to have a hot tub and a full bar and have my little cat here this is a thousand bucks I got this cat I then I paid my ex for him so my ex and I have a separation and we aren't really friends anymore but they know I'm still they love me enough I guess or know I love my animals enough to trust me with the cat so I have I have uh, little money which is another cat I have and I have more money this is, this is more money right here this guy and uh, they're my motivation I guess to like make fans happy outside the ring that if you don't like me but you like the animal then come up and give me five minutes and at least you can pet the cat and be happy with that or get a picture with the cat with your kid if you don't respect me you respect the fact that I love animals so and you briefly mentioned uh, Jim Cornette earlier. Did he ever actually confront you face to face, or has it all been? He never said shit. Never pulled his hand, you know. And yeah, I never talked to him. Never, he never said anything over to me. I saw him at a TNA show, and I was nice to him. Then that's the only time he said that in his little interview. I saw Teddy Hart at TNA. I didn't even recognize him, and I said, "Yeah, because I'm, I'm." Uh, I mean, Jim Cornette. I don't know much about his whole whole shtick or what he was what he did for wrestling. I heard he had a great mind for wrestling. I also heard from other guys that he was terrible for wrestling and he always kept things pretty generic and simple. And I don't know enough to say much about him except for what he said about me on that thing wasn't accurate. It wasn't true. And he was sounding like he was, uh, you know, the, the fucking gospel truth or he was God and that's how things are. And what I said was stupid and I was delusional or something like that. And I think he's more delusional if you actually go back and listen to what I said and then what he said and what happened and what happened with the fans. And they were still there weren't booing at the end of my backflips every backflip I did they were cheering their ass off right till I went into the back of the show so uh, I think that was again his way of spinning it because he doesn't remember what happened he's not going to go back I don't think he'll watch the video and you did have a legit concussion right? yeah, is that the one where you threw, threw up because you throw yeah. up when you have a concussion exactly <laughs> and I threw up all over the ring so and I never threw up in any other match in my career not once and I've wrestled for like a lot of matches and I've done a lot of shit and never once threw up yeah, so. and I had a concussion once and the same thing happened I was throwing up all night yep and they tell you actually not to eat yeah for that very reason now were you surprised you were at De uh, Bret Hart's WWE Hall of Fame induction were you surprised after all he said and after he ridiculed Davey for going back to WWE that he ultimately went into the WWE Hall of Fame and I was hoping he'd just get over it and go back even faster I mean I can't say that it would have I can't say Bret's a hypocrite because he did go I mean I wanted him to go back for the best interest of the family and personally selfish reasons that if Brett went back, maybe I'd get a job. I mean, that's being honest. But I thought Brett should have went back way earlier. Like, instead of waiting so long to go back, it was too late. That he ruined a lot of deals, man. And he never did anything to make it up. It wasn't like one thing. If Brett had done this, but he, he didn't, he, Brett didn't play ball, but he played ball in all these other ways. Brett just sat around in a city where, he, because of what happened to him, he, he was upset and he never did anything to help out anybody else. Just, yeah, and it hid, basically. And then after that, everything faded, and he never developed any wrestling in Calgary. He never opened up a school in Calgary. Neither one of his kids got into the business, which I think was a shame. Uh, so I don't know. I just I, that is one of those things where I think Brett responsible. Brett needs to take responsibility for certain things that he did, and I think he killed wrestling in Calgary. Uh, definitely didn't help it at all. And uh, even in Canada, in a, as a general thing, I think people were hoping Brett would step up, and maybe if he done like a Ring of Honor in Canada with Brett's brains and Brett's connections and Brett's money and Brett's uh, ability to make people I mean people love Bret Hart and never say they don't but if, if you know that and you're that big of a superstar please pass the torch on and please help other guys and please help wrestling itself because you were a guy that loved wrestling and talked about wrestling and sounded like you cared about the, the direction wrestling was going in that's what your whole complaint was with Sean that you didn't like the direction wrestling was going in and you wanted to make it more family orientated and about great matches and moves and not about fucking weird promos and weird characters and then after you had that happen to you just kind of dropped off the map and understand the concussion and understand the stroke but I think those things happen because maybe uh, he wasn't doing anything and the stroke obviously is they say came from the concussion but I saw Brett get kicked a lot and hit in the head a lot I don't know if that one kick specifically was just the just the, maybe it was like accumulation of things and the stress of Owen dying and all that stuff that happened you know in a in a weird in a weird combination happened and that's what caused him to have the uh, the attitude towards not doing anything with wrestling again and then to come back so late after 
and then being given an opportunity to do stuff with Raw or SmackDown or as a GM or whatever and kind of blowing that off I thought definitely put a sour taste in WWE's mouth again about trying to bring Brett back and hoping he would have been more uh, proactive in being a character on TV even to this day now but I guess he doesn't want to travel much and it's like but I don't think the traveling first class in an airplane and getting picked up in a limo is that bad it wasn't like you know what I mean like I think Brett probably pr would be treated pretty good if he was on Raw or SmackDown as a character were you at at the Brett versus Vince WrestleMania match where you I was there and I got cut out of anything there too. I don't know how or why. But I was supposed to kind of be involved, I thought. I mean my whole family was there. I didn't even bother going to the show. Even Bruce and I didn't Smith. bother sitting in the audience because they yeah. Family. They, I was, I was, I was, I got hurt the night before on Dragon's Gate, and then they, they had nothing for me to do anything. They barely, I had to pay for my own ticket. I was the only member of the whole family that paid for his own ticket. Everyone else got paid to be there. They actually got paid to be there. I never even got a dollar. Wow. I don't know why I was the only one. I was again one of those things where I, I think people were, uh, were. I had a brand new wife, and my wife and I had a lot of money, and people that were like you know that were watching me I think wanted to see me take a fall for once they somehow I always land on my feet I always end up in a nice house or I end up with a beautiful girlfriend or I end up with a, a fucking brand new car somehow and I think people thought for once maybe this was the time uh, that Ted was gonna get you know the what he deserved type of thing people wanted to see me fall and I ended up landing on a very lucky uh, gold mine with my wife and her business and her money and I mean that was the five years of my life where I didn't see the family a lot not one time the family came up to my house to see my mansion or to see all my cats or to see all the stuff I'd collected or to drive in all the different cars I had and I was disappointed uh, when I went to WWE at that time that the they were almost they were the feeling I was like and that's right because then I'm talking the reason I'm saying what I'm saying was I was released from WWE before that. So everyone thought that ah, Ted's fired the second time. Uh, that's it for him. Stick a fork in him. I went to Mexico, reinvented myself again there. But then from Mexico, made a lot of money in Mexico, came back from Mexico. And instead of getting fucked, when I went back to Canada, I ended up meeting her. And Faye and I hit it off and I made a lot of money there with her. So I think people thought that based on the WWE failure that eventually I'm going to blow out, you know, and, and just burn out. And that was it for me. And then from there, I went to Mexico and everybody thought in Mexico it was going to be probably the same thing he's a drug addict he's going to get fucked up down there it's like no nah, guys I smoke weed not a drug addict coke's coke you're a cokehead drug you're a drug addict you're a crackhead you're a drug addict you're on pills you're a drug addict you smoke pot you're a pothead there's a big difference between drug addicts that are hardcore drug addicts and a guy that's smoking marijuana and taking steroids with a prescription big difference so Mexico is a place guess what's legal in Mexico yeah steroids, steroids. and guess what else is legal in Mexico fucking it's weird yeah basically and you don't have to fuck it's not that it's legal but nobody's really going around with a microscope looking for fucking marijuana they don't care you pay a cop off you know you're not hurting anybody when you smoke weed the weed's so shitty in mexico anyway that no one's really you know, it's you know it's like whatever yeah. you know but just like and steroids down there again are legal and steroids are something i think people should take with uh with the right education on it that they're there to help you use properly they get you to a place that you want to be i don't see that i, I think steroids get a bad stigma and I think a lot of guys that are in WWE and on TV and over the years uh, they say they've never done juice I question that and I'm not going to point out names but I, I have they a do allow it testosterone replacement yeah, now, my back has said it I, I'm one of the guys that qualified for testosterone replacement with WWE when I was there when I was uh 27 or whenever I was there when I was young way younger that's when I got it I was the youngest guy to ever get it that's why I say well, all these years I've had a prescription to take steroids that's why I talk about it and you don't hear me going hey this guy this guy this guy and this guy all say they're not on the juice when they are that's not my thing dude I'm not trying to point out I'm not trying to make uh, an argument of that I'm better than this guy or this guy did this and he's lying about it I understand public uh, opinion I understand image and that some of these guys have to protect their image and they're they're in the public eye and they're training with kids and they're doing stuff with kids help phone or with uh like uh, making make a wish network and stuff and um you know like i understand their image i'm not trying to call them out i just think guys and the real fans that watch tv they know who's taking stuff and who's not and i would think the guys that are taking stuff are actually taking stuff because they want to look good for you the people so don't use it against the guy use it as he's he's probably in his in, in what people think are taking years off your life by taking stuff uh to to make it look good that to the reason they're looking good or trying to do that is because they respect the fans they, and they respect the character and they take the job of being a wrestler that seriously you know one guy that's had those accusations and we're both friends with him uh, but I'm not asking you about those accusations is Jinder Mahal and are you surprised that uh, 
out of all of us, I guess, he's the first one from the, the Calgary group of our generation to become a WWE champion. Jinder Mahal's a class act, and uh, congratulations on taking opportunity that most guys I don't think would have known what the fuck to do with, considering you were there before and we weren't really successful, but you made a lot of money, at least enough to buy a house and travel the world, and uh, went back and instead of being depressed and lazy and uh, unmotivated, went there and just fucking killed it, hit the gym like a madman. Nothing's harder than the gym, guys, and the diet. Brian Cage will tell you more than anybody to look that good is a consistent 24 hour a day fucking job. I've looked pretty good a couple times, but nothing's harder than bodybuilding and wrestling at the same time. So Jinder Mahal, uh, to me, I, I take my hat off to you for taking an opportunity and hitting a home run with it and taking the taking a body that was not bad and making it into a fucking uh, masterpiece and look like a stud and always nice to me same thing never really superstar me i hope if i see in the future you got five minutes to talk and it's not one of those guys that went from being really nice to everybody and super humble and then all of a sudden he becomes a world champion and he turns into an asshole you know what i mean so I, I hope he's one of those guys that still remembers where he came from and the guys that were always nice to him i was always nice to him and respected him as a person and uh, i thought again uh, i'm not trying to sound like a, a repeat record but i hope he's one of those guys that continues getting success in the future because he helps guys from Calgary uh, and helps guys uh, that maybe didn't make it the first time or second time to still think that there's a chance like even with me maybe if I get in really really good shape and that's the last part of my uh, figuring out the puzzle is to be in tremendous shape not just look pretty good and have a six but to, but to be in like world-class shape and I still think I've never shown the world how big Teddy Hart can get and I'd like this this year this next two years for me I believe I have a two-year window where Tyson Kidd's an agent and Natalia's in a position of power and respected and that there's a lot of guys I've helped out in WWE that are there now I don't need to say all the names of guys that, that know they've been through my house or they've been in the ring with me or I've I've talked to them at shows and we're friends uh, I think it put in a good word for me uh, even just like I say simple as Jericho maybe I could call Jericho someday and be like listen here's my pictures here's my tapes here's the proof and here's all the good reports and bookings and uh, here's like two years three years of Teddy Hart with no problems no legal problems no uh, no stories of me being anything but helpful and uh, great matches and here's a bunch of matches with guys that are all guys that are either moving on to TV or are on TV or that are about to get on TV now and uh, how I've helped them become better superstars or develop talent and that would be something uh, that's used as a as a stepping stone or positive thing that I, they can finally say something good about Teddy Hart to get me a job you know when people have something good to say and they can vouch for you Devin you know what I mean like that's that's an important thing so I want to give them that opportunity where there's nothing they can say really bad about me you know and it's like that's it's a tough thing to do because it's so easy to talk shit about people you know Enzo uh, I'm sure you're aware of this because it was a similar situation to you it hasn't been found if he's uh, he's sure he certainly hasn't been convicted yet but he ha he's had some accusations and yeah. just, he's lost his job and I'm just wondering your opinion on that and what what advice you would you would tell the guy this that, guy doesn't like Enzo maybe I don't know he's biting me now you said Enzo's name and all of a sudden he's he's biting the shit out of me so I don't know or maybe maybe uh, maybe this guy's giving me the sign that Poor Enzo's dealing with the same stress that I had. And it's, it caused me to go crazy thinking that how the fuck could I have somebody charge me with sexual assault when it's the last thing in the world I'd ever do is sexually assault a woman. If any women assault me or sexually assaulted me, I've never had any. I've, it would be the opposite. So Enzo, I don't know. I don't see him being... Uh, <laughs> this guy's biting the shit out of me. I'm sorry. I never had him bite me so much in training. <laughs> he, he doesn't like Enzo or something. I don't know. But... <laughs> Uh, I, I feel bad for Enzo, like, I don't really know him, I've never really heard too much except that he's uh, kind of a horse's ass from different people that, but I mean that could be just bullshit, like I've heard stuff about me that's not true directly or that that's an opinion of somebody but it's not actually the only opinion, there's lots of different ones out there. He has a job, he had a job, he was on TV, he made money, he had a belt, congratulations on all that stuff, it's stuff I've never done. So I mean I give you credit, if I haven't done it myself how can I take it away from somebody who has? But at the same time, uh, if he did do that shit to the girls, uh, it'll be proven in a court and I say to anybody, I hope uh, if it's not guilty, if he's not guilty then people 
people forgive him and they they give him his job back and an opportunity and if it is true then go have some fun in jail brother because i've been in jail uh, as a guy that sexually assaulted somebody and it's not a fun place to be and if you don't look like if, you know if you're not in good shape and most guys looked at me and said ah you don't look like the kind of guy that sexually assaulted anybody you good looking guy in shape probably not a guy that's raping women i said no usually it's the opposite way around if anything women have been aggressive to me or sexually assaulted me or called me lazy or unmotivated because i didn't want to uh, stir the soup as my friend said you know i don't feel like doing work half the time i'd rather sleep uh, and that's because i've been with women i've dealt with women and i've i guess i'm burnt out of uh burnt out with girls so but my my brain set would be if you did molest or did rape or did hurt any woman out there very stupid to do because karma's a son of a bitch and it's going to catch you and uh if you didn't do it and they said it about you it's a horrible thing to have to deal with and i hope he gets the right uh i hope justice is is done what, what's the word justice is served yeah justice is served so if you right, this little we're just winding it down here one guy who i really liked uh, one of your uncles uh, i guess the oldest uncle is smith who unfortunately passed away uh, see you love smith they eh? said that you got along good because smith is funny and you like that kind of funny smith's crazy so but you're you're uh <laughs> you're pretty crazy too so <laughs> all right so we'll leave smith at that and i'll I'm just wondering. I love Smith, and God bless God, God bless Smith in his memory. But Smith was a uh, wild card, and he was he was uh, he was a character. We'll just say that <laughs> a character. So. <laughs> and I'll just have to ask you because I'm sure everyone's gonna want to know uh, your opinion on uh, Roman Reigns. Everyone wants him to turn heel. I guess there's been so much debate on the push that he's had. Um. I watched Roman Reigns wrestle Undertaker, and I thought it was a great match. I haven't watched. I don't watch a lot of WWE TV. Uh, I'm usually on the road, or I'm working. A, I had a job as a bouncer at a strip club for the last couple of years. So like I say, I finally got a job and did construction for a while, and then I did the, the the night job at the strip club. So I didn't have a lot of time to watch them. To be and usually I was living in like weird places, so I didn't have opportunity to get the network. I had to unload a computer guy. So from whatever I've seen of Roman Reigns, uh, one of the best looking guys in wrestling history, I think. Great look. Um, why do you think they cover him up? Uh, he has, I heard he had a scar on his stomach because he had gotten a surgery, but I don't know. I mean, I don't know. I, I, he's lucky to get away with wearing that outfit so he doesn't have to, if you know, maybe you don't have to have your abs as good, but his arms always look great. Uh, good looking, se sexy man. No, no, no homo either. I don't, I'm just saying. But uh, if I'm watching Roman Reigns and I'm a fan, uh, I could show him every girl I've ever seen that's watching with me. Always thinks he's, uh, you know, handsome guy like The Rock. That same oh, every time, you know, he's got that look. So uh, with his look, I, I think he could do more moves. I wish he did a bit more moves, but for what he does do, it looks pretty solid. And uh, I don't know why the fans are so hard on him. But at the same time, that's their that's the WWE network, and that's their the WWE universe, isn't it? The WWE universe, they're weird about shit. So, yes. Um, if American Dragon gets that, you know, whatever his little chant, and he's the most popular guy based on that chant, and I remember Rikishi and uh, fucking whatever his name was, those two guys, Scotty Too Hotty and uh, yeah, Brian right. Christopher, or whatever the, they had that fucking what was it? Who was the other guy? Uh, Taylor. Uh, Scott Taylor. Yeah, for, I I vaguely remember it. They used to get a huge pop all the yeah. time, and I was like, but if they were, I don't know, like the WWE universe is weird about how they decide if guys are are good or not, and like Roman Reigns and John Cena, same thing gets a lot of booze and shit like that too, right? So I don't know. I just thought uh, from whatever I saw, I always always looked a part of being a wrestler and worked pretty hard and has a tough schedule and uh, I wish him the best of luck and congratulations on having the pressure of being part of that family and, and carrying on again uh, as as The Rock has done I think Roman Reigns will continue on and end up being a movie star and uh, hopefully is a successful movie star too because he's got a great look and uh, I don't have anything bad to say about him I don't know him and the last question I'll ask you about, I don't know if you've ever met her, but I know you've, you've known a lot of divas over the years is Paige and the, the controversy she's dealt with. I never ever met Paige yet. I don't think, maybe I saw her one time in my life and uh, I did watch those pornos really quickly because someone sent them to me. This is one of the few things that I thought for her to get a job back was pretty crazy. So 
I, it gave me hope that if Paige got her job back and got away with that shit, that Teddy Hart could maybe get a job in there somehow. So I thought Paige was like maybe somehow a blessing in disguise that if she got away with what she did and their understanding about it and trying to help her and, you know, then fuck maybe the I guess the thing was she never put the video like she made yeah the but video making those whatever. videos is making those videos is bad enough I, I mean you don't see me getting my porno shit leaked out I mean I've been supposedly doing crazy stuff and partying and a swinger and all this stuff for all these years and never ever had anything leaked you know I'm not that famous but I think there would have been an opportunity where it could have got out there or I could have put it out there on purpose to try to get a to try to get fame out of it and I never did once so I don't know I just that's another one of those ones where it's like uh, it sounds kind of suspect that it happened and like the shit you're doing and saying and like if that's what you're doing with your free time and you're supposed to be you know a superstar and a role model and different things it didn't seem like your head was in the right place and uh, I mean Night. She had a nice ass, and she looked like she sucked pretty good dick. <laughs> I mean, from a porn star standpoint, so she would have been fun to hang out with, maybe. But uh, I'm surprised she got her job back. And, you know, good I'm, for her. I'm sure it has did. something to do with The Rocks doing a movie about her, which was already in the works before. <laughs> I don't even know. I had another one of those no comments. I don't know how. What? What? How the? What? What's The Rocks movie about? I don't know, but it's it's like three something in the morning. So we'll let you. Is there anything you want to say to close this off? Uh well, just uh, me and Devin went out last night with uh, WWE Diva, and she seemed really cool. It's the first time I met her, uh, basically outside of watching her on TV. And I'll thank her for having a uh, taking us to uh, what was that <laughs> hot dog place for yeah. a dynamic oh, dog. This is a lot. You love mustard, right? <laughs> Randy Myers told me to ask you this: like, what's your favorite? What is this favorite type of mustard that you have? He saw you throw a fit once because your mom didn't have <laughs> oh, this special. It was mustard. yellow mustard. I, they, they had the honey mustard. I didn't want honey mustard on my hot dog. <laughs> that's Randy Myers is fucking making a story up, but that's that's not so true. Um, yeah, no, that's bullshit. I just we went to that some restaurant last night. I forget what it was called. It was a hot dog place uh, in Philly. And they had like kangaroo and python and fucking like boar and shark hot dog and all these different types of hot dogs. So Melina took us there. And I was her, like, I guess, uh, to go out and have a good time and eat a bunch of wieners and stuff like that. So it was, it was, it was an interesting time. I should have brought my cat. I think I would have been more successful in uh, not getting. Kicked. Me and Devin almost got kicked out of there. Devin was filming some stuff, and they got mad at us for having the camera. And uh, not Molina, but some assholes. Yeah, some assholes. So I mean, it was an interesting night. I'm just happy I got to see Hannibal on another. He's one of my old friends, one of my best friends from the past, and we'd been through a lot of shit together. And, like we, we will do another interview again because there's some stories I want to talk about like my old house the pool house I want to mention some of the stuff like that and uh, some girls that we dated back in the day Gabrielle I'll say her name on this video now and some, <laughs> some some weird shit with a citizens arrest I made and like some fights at the bars and like different things but we he, we were supposed to do this interview last night and then we ended up s s drinking a bit and uh, I wasn't drinking, but I was basically chaperoning a bunch of people that were drinking, and Devin was nice enough to take us around and drive us around and take care of the meals.